welcome everybody. Um, tonight we have uh, members uh, participating remotely, so we'll start by asking the members who are remote to uh, identify themselves. And Donna, you're muted. Right. This is Pauline Cohn, oh. District Two Councilor. Okay. And Don <laughs> now I think we can hear you, Donna. I'm very sorry for the interruption, Palin. I was trying to get unmuted by the official. I'm Donna Bates, City Council, District One. Okay, thank you. With that, the meeting is called to order. I'll mention a little bit about meeting logistics. Um, if anyone who's joining remotely, I would appreciate it if you would uh, put your full name on display on the screen. And anyone who wishes to speak, please start by stating your name and where you live. We ask that everyone keep your comments to three minutes. And uh, Councillor Bate will help us uh, keep track of time. If you're here to speak about a particular item on the agenda, we ask you to keep your comments to that item. And anyone who speaks out of turn will be, uh, or over time will be uh, hauled back into compliance. <laughs> and first item is to approve the agenda. Is there any anyone requesting any changes to the agenda tonight? I have not heard of any. Okay, we'll deem the agenda to be approved. Next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council about any topic which is not on the agenda for tonight. And as with other uh, comments, we uh, ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. We'll start to see if there's anyone in the room who wishes to be heard. Okay, why don't you step right up? And come on up, come on up to the microphone so that we can uh, pick you up. Alrighty. Yeah, I have a petition. And uh, would you start you. with your, Ron? Would you start by introducing yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ron Merkin, uh, Barry Street. Thank you. I have a petition. Uh, but I solicited, I have 70 signatures. Some people may think that 70 is not very impressive. On the other hand, I did not do this online. I did it in person, time permitting. So it's, so the, the gist of it is, we the undersigned protest the proposal for an overnight shelter for the homeless people in Montpelier's rec center. Not only is the rec center used by children for after school activities, its location is directly across the street from the Senior Activity Center. 16 seniors live in apartments above the Senior Center. One is wheelchair bound. Three others need walkers to get around. At times in the past, homeless people have smoked marijuana and unfortunately some other things while sitting on benches in the outdoor parklet in front of the Senior Center. Somehow marijuana makes its way up and through closed apartment windows. Clothing and paraphernalia have at times been discarded in the parklet. Every Wednesday, the Senior Center hosts open gym hours between 7 and 9 p.m. These times are reserved for youths and families. On Fridays, the closing is later, 10 p.m. Where do you think the homeless will wait until they can get in? The parklet in front of the Senior Center, of course. Considering how long it may take rec center staff to get beds and cots ready after open gym players re, uh, relieve, the, uh, the wait could last until nearly 11 p.m. Like everyone, seniors need their sleep. Something that uh, was interesting when I was uh, circulating this petition was that a few people brought up the subject of the fact that uh, a bus recently was um, hit by someone with a, with a, a gun. And they said that that was one reason why they felt impelled to uh, to uh, be a signature on this petition. That reminded some of the others, actually, that I spoke with about the knifing incident when the transit uh, center was doubling as an overnight shelter 
for a few years. Uh, apparently, somebody who was volunteering there was seriously injured with a knife. Uh, finally, I wonder where uh, the people would go who presently go to the uh, rec center for sports if uh, your your grant fund that you're trying to get is uh, comes through, and and that may lead to a total different senior uh, rec center than we're aware of. Uh, I purposely uh, abbreviated a lot of things in there because of your three-minute uh, rule, et cetera. But I do have uh, the, um, let's see, I do have uh, photocopies. Seven of them I made because I thought maybe seven counselors would be here that I would like to distribute to you. Okay. Sure, thank you. Can I just leave the um, these around now or? Sure. Okay, because I, I, it's supposed to be someplace else tonight. Well, I'm glad we were able to. Uh, you can't see what? You can just leave them with Kelly or Evelyn, and the, they'll distribute them for you. So I have some, as I said, um, I'll leave both of them in case you want to give them. Yeah, them. yeah, just leave them with them. Great, thank you. Okay. Anybody else in the room who'd like to be heard? Okay, I'm looking at the people on Zoom. And I'm not seeing any. Oh, okay. I wasn't seeing you, Donna. Uh, speak right up. And that means you're going to need to be unmuted again. Um, okay. And my question is just about that procedure. How do we get ourselves unmuted when we want to make a motion, et cetera? I'm looking to Kelly. Can counselors stay unmuted? Yeah, is it possible to keep uh, Donna and uh, Palin unmuted? Great, thank you. So, Donna and Palin, you will remain unmuted while the members of the public are muted, and that should uh, take care of that. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> um, looking through the members of the public, I'm not seeing anybody else who's looking to be recognized. Okay. Michael. It'll, it'll take a moment to unmute you. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor and Council and everyone in attendance. I apologize, I got here late are you taking public comment across the entire agenda now or or on a specific topic? Tonight, we, right now, we're on general business and appearances, and this is public comment on uh, topics that are not on the agenda. Okay, so you'll take public comment as each item comes along? Okay, I'll wait till later then because I'm here for a specific okay. item. Thank you, and I apologize for the interruption. Oh, no problem at all. Anybody else? that I'm not seeing and maybe somebody else does. Okay, time to move to the consent agenda. Is there a, is there a motion? I make a motion to pass the consent agenda. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Next up, Homelessness Task Force status update. Thank you for pointing me to the task force. Um, this is my first appearance here before you. I appreciate the time. Um, in light of you all seeing the report, uh, the feasibility report about Barry Street Rec Center last time you were together, we thought it would be useful to just share with you a basic update on what's happening in the community around homelessness. 
Um, just a caveat that these numbers are really hard to establish. Um, the folks who are experiencing homelessness are typically very transient as they find their way. Um, and so it's really hard for us to get anything really solid, but we did the best we could. Um, I'm gonna just break it. I, we broke it into two sections, really looking at unsheltered homelessness. These are folks who are living out of doors, who have limited access to things like bathrooms, electricity, um, cooking and laundry facilities, and then also sheltered homelessness. And these are folks who are utilizing local shelters and state-run motel programs. Um, uh, the first, uh, just under unsheltered homelessness, our street outreach team has seen an increase uh, in the last few years, but particularly post-flood. Uh, and is serving about 80 individuals um, throughout the area. Uh, they typically range uh, primarily in Montpelier, but also serve some people in other neighboring towns. Um, we are, uh, the flood in particular has caused a lot of uh, hard times for folks to find uh, uh, good places to camp safely. And so the outreach team spends a lot of their time supporting people to find locations that are safe. Um, there's also, because of the flood, limited access to things like uh, bathrooms, uh, day shelter, and other resources locally. And then, of course, you all know those things are starting to come back online, and things have been getting better in town in particular, but that's been, uh, over the last few months, um, a, a high impact on uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, on the bright side are uh, local faith organizations who historically have served lunch throughout town, although many of the kitchens were impacted, have come together and are providing uh, lunches five days a week, all out of Christ Church, and that will continue um, uh, into the foreseeable future. It's been great to see them collaborating and working together to provide that support. And another way continues to serve folks with day space and meals as well. Um, in terms of Sheltered homelessness, Good Samaritan Haven, where I work, uh, is our primary um, primary shelter, but we also have motels in the region that are supporting folks who are uh, sheltered and homeless. Um, and those counts that I gave you there are based on uh, both the 2020 and 2023 point in time count. So in 2020, we had 260 people who were uh, utilizing area shelters, motels, or living outside. And in January of 2023, that number was at 446. And just keep in mind that that January 446 number is pre-flood. So that does not account for folks who have been displaced because of the flood. Um, if you have a digital copy, you can follow those links to look at the point in time counts. You can also access the state's coordinated entry, which will also provide you some um, useful information. If you wanna look at coordinated entry, just open in your browser and let it sit for a few minutes. It takes a little while for it to come up, but it's pretty interesting uh, and it gives a, a, great, a great snapshot. Um, of the three emergency shelters that are operated by Good Samaritan that offer 61 beds, we remain nearly full. We do have wiggle room and, and often can still provide shelter, but those, uh, it's tight. Um, and just a note on that, we wanted to share also uh, that at Good Samaritan, we have seen an increase in numbers of uh, the guests that we serve who are over the age of 55. And that number stands right now at 40% across our shelter network are over the age of 55. If you, uh, you may have seen some national and even local um, reporting that shows those numbers are meant to stay steady or increase in the future based on our demographics. So that's something to keep in mind as you start forecasting what the needs of the city are on this issue. Um, and then the, la the last thing on that is just to say that across the board, the the needs and of the folks who are that we're serving who are unsheltered are have really become increasingly complex over the last few years. A lot of folks are, uh, with physical and mental um, disabilities, uh, also uh, medical conditions, neurodiversity, substance use disorder, whether active or uh, in recovery. So that's just to say uh, a lot of other support beyond shelter is often um, necessary. And then in terms of winter preparedness, uh, with the support of this council and the support of the city, Good Samaritan will be opening a 15-bed shelter on Monday the 13th. That's just this coming Monday up at the Elks. Uh, that's uh, That work is underway. Uh, that shelter will be open until April 30th. And another way will continue to be open, providing day space as well as meals um, weekly uh, or all week long. Um, and that's about it. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, any um, questions?
I know that uh, AHS just released their new uh, program designer, the regulations this week. Um, how does that contribute to uh, meeting the, the needs here in Montpelier? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is the, as far as I know, it's the pretty much the typical winter support shelter that's provided by AHS. Um, that'll be, it's conditional based on whatever the weather is doing. So I don't have it uh, committed to memory, but based on weather conditions that the state has um, uh, decided are, um, would have an adverse effect on someone staying outside, they will be given eligibility uh, to a motel room. Um, I'm happy to send it along. And there's also a, um, the state also released a sheet that just kind of uh, gauges capacity for each of the motels in different regions. And as far as I could see, Montpelier and Barry region was in the kind of like, okay, we have some wiggle room zone, not super, super full. Um, that's I just read that today, but I'm also happy to send that along. You know, I don't, I don't want to, be critical of AHS. They're doing what there is what they have to do. But the the idea that somebody would have to demonstrate that it would have an adverse impact on them to have to sleep outside in the winter is uh, mm -hmm. is kind of mind boggling. Yeah, and I think what the task force will be doing in the coming weeks is starting to kind of gather a little bit of um, ideas and foresight for the future, particularly with our eye on. Um, looking at what happens at the, on the April 24 deadline for AHS around the motel program. As you all remember, we were all anticipating this motel exodus in June, and that was more of a, the guidelines were changed kind of in the middle of it, and it was a bit of a trickle, and, um, and the impact was kind of harder to see. It was less all at once. Um, but uh, those guidelines are, we're still up against another deadline in April, as far as we know. So we'll be, uh, the task force will be looking at that and starting to think about what kind of pre preparations we need to do for April as well. Thanks. Annie, Lauren. Yeah, um, it's really helpful just to get the snapshot. Like we're right now um, have been developing and I think next council meeting we'll be looking at what the city is going to be asking the state to do to step up and do more. Um, I'm just curious, uh, given what sounds like pretty dire status, um, you know, is it already clear some, you know, like more peer support outreach staffing or are there things that we should be sure to include in our asks of the state as we try to find resources to support people? Yeah, I mean, that's what um, actually our, our meeting on Wednesday is intended to do as we were going to draft kind of a short list of recommendations for the council, really thinking about um, what are some kind of stop gaps that we could put in place that could be supportive um, and what are some larger requests. I think shelter baseline is always the request. People just need shelter. Um, and I think the state's fully aware of that um they're under they're feeling the pressure of that april deadline as well so um i would be happy to pass that along as long as as soon as we develop that list as well that'd be great thanks i just and... i i wanted to note one more thing which i i forgot to mention i both another way and good samaritan who have representation on the task force serve adults and so it was a little harder for us to find more information about children and families. And so that is listed in here in the point in time count. But some of you may have noticed some um, some talk on Front Porch Forum in the last few weeks around uh, some of the um, support that Heading Church and Barry does with children and families. And so I reached out to Heading Church, to their outreach coordinator, just to you know see what it, things were looking like on the ground over there. And they did say that they certainly were seeing an increase of parents and children who were living both in motels, in campers, and sometimes in cars as well. Um, she had also spoken with a representative in the month prior from the Barry School District who said that they had 78 un unsheltered children in the district. So just thinking not just about Montpelier as a, and again, numbers are challenging, that is not solid, but I think, um, Continuing to think somewhat regionally about the issue, Montpelier is a center that people will come to from other places as well. And so we are definitely impacted by the neighboring towns and the experiences that they're having as well. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I got here late because I didn't know where the meeting was, but. Why, why don't you step up to okay. the microphone and introduce yourself? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, hi, uh, Dan, I'm on there, um, top of Main Street. And I'm sorry I got here late because I thought the meeting was elsewhere. But um, if you're taking testimony about the um, the additional fees for short-term rentals, that's not. Is that happening we tonight? Will, we will get to that. Okay. Sorry to disturb you. It's okay. Okay. Thanks, Meredith. Okay. Next up, Housing Committee. Proposal on short-term rentals. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Copans. Nice to see you all. Um, I am a member of the Montpelier Housing Committee. I'm a longtime resident of Montpelier, grew up here. Um, and my family and I have lived on Cliff Street for about 15 years. Um, I'm joined tonight with um, at least two members of my housing committee behind me. And then I know a few also are on the on, on Zoom with us as well. So thank you for everyone, to everyone for joining us. Um, so um, the Montpelier Housing Committee was created last year um, by the city council. And we were given a pretty heavy task to solve this problem called the housing crisis. Um, the people who spoke before us, um, before me really outlined how critical this need is um, and what it means to one family or five families or 446 families um, who don't have housing in Montpelier. Um, the housing committee was tasked with um, with this, this uh, you know, a housing solving the housing problem, which is a big a big task, and we really framed it in three um, three ways. <laughs> One is what can we do in the immediate term? Um, what is what can we do in the midterm, which is maybe two to two to three to four years? And what is um, what can we do in the long term, which is five years or more? Um, and when we think about you know the bigger projects like Habitat for Humanity or the Elks Club, um, that's long term. We're not going to put housing on the ground with, in, with these major projects um, next year. Um, so when we think about what we can do now, um, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, is the short-term rentals in Montpelier. Um, so regulating short-term rentals is an immediate step that the city can take. Um, our goal is to support people who, um, who work here, who volunteer here, which is so critical after the flood. Um, who attend our schools and who want to live in Montpelier but just can't because they can't find um, housing. Um, we, the housing committee wants to provide opportunities for year-round residents um, who, who want to rent or own in Montpelier. And so our goal is to increase um, long-term housing supply, um, which if we can increase the overall, overall numbers, it'll drive down prices and it'll increase affordability as well. Um, when we look at the short-term rentals, people say, well, why this is such a small, you know, maybe it's just such a small um, number of properties that this would affect in Montpelier. Um, there was a data poll in November, um, thanks to uh, Josh Jerome, um, 78 unique listings um, in Montpelier. And of those 72 are unique properties um, that have short-term rentals. Um, Something that we really struggle with also is um, as more cities and towns regulate short-term rentals, investors look elsewhere, and Montpelier is increasingly um, attractive to, in, to uh, invest, investors. And so by passing this, um, this ordinance, we'd be sending a message that Montpelier is a place to live. It's not a place to um, buy up long-term housing and take those long-term housing houses off, um, off the market. So we've really broken down this 
proposal into two um, pieces. The first recommendation is to, um, through a city ordinance, restrict short-term rentals to properties declared as an owner's homestead. So we're not saying that if you, or I, I should say, we're, we are saying that if you own and live in your home and you declare that your homestead, we're not looking to eliminate your ability to have a short-term rental. Um, a short-term rental is something that is less rented less than 30 days. Um, and over a year term, it's rented for more than 14 days. Um, so this would, this proposal would allow, um, if you live in your home, if you have a, if you, um, have a property that where you declare that you declare as your homestead, you can rent out a room, you can rent out the entire house, the entire home. If you have a duplex, you could rent, continue to rent out half of your duplex or a triplex, um, as long as it's your homestead. What we're saying, um, kind of we're drawing, drawing the line in the sand with is renting out a property that is not, um, that is not your homestead on a short-term basis. And when people say, well, what would I do? Um, you can rent it long-term or you can sell it, um, but you can't rent it in the short-term. Um, here are definitions just to be crystal clear. Owner-occupied means the primary residence um, that the owner claims on their homestead declaration. Um, a short-term rental, I just went through, um, it's at least 30 days. So something this would not affect is legislator housing or traveling nurses. Um, legislators generally come for four months um, during the legislative session. So this would not apply to um, places that are rented to them. Um, what this would allow is if you have an ADU and you rent it out, if you have a cabin, I know there's one on on College Street um, that's in on the property um, of the of the the property owner, that would still be allowed. Um, so the home homestead declaration, we really um, went back and forth for many months about how to make this very clear. Um, and the homestead de declaration is something that this the state um, collects. Um, everyone has to that owns a property has to say what where their homestead is. Um, so it's it's easily verifiable. So um, I I passed around some more uh, more specific details, and I, I just should say um, anything underlined is in in the actual proposal is um, our suggestions that as I met with city councilors. Um, I wanted to be clear what we passed um, as the, the city council, as the um, housing committee. Um, anything that we passed is not underlined. Anything that is underlined was a suggestion from city council. So I just wanted to reflect um, what the what the edits, recommended edits are in here. Um, so you can follow along if you'd like. So um, we are proposing that you, if you were allowed to have a short-term rental, we would suggest that they register, they become registered. That would allow, um, so in other municipalities that regulate short-term rentals, they're given a, um, a, a number and a registration number that they use um, when they're advertising their property, they put it on their, um, on the ad, and then that property can be verified against registration. Um, we are recommending that, um, there'd be a, a, a registration fee to help subsidize the cost of, um, of um, just the additional burden to the, uh, sorry, the, do you have a plug? Um, the additional burden to the city, sorry. Um, and uh, so, and then we're asking, um, so at the beginning of this conversation, a year ago, everyone said, um, could, they really wanted to know where, what the problem was <laughs> that we were talking about. And, you know, we don't have the data that, um, that would, that would, you know, show that this is a, a problem. And so um, we're recommending data collection um, on, on annual registration. So um, Every year, um, if someone is re-registering their, their property, they would have to um, list the address that the property um, is is at, um, the dwelling type, if it's a partial or whole unit, um, the number of days that each short-term rental was rented out in the past 12 months, and um, the number of stays and the amount charged. 
And so it can give the city a better a better sense of what the problem is. Um, another thing that is came very became very clear is um, there's not a great understanding of what um, compliance means for a short a short term rental. Whether short term rentals have to comply with long term rental codes. Um, so this would make it very clear that you have to comply with um, all the other. Um, state housing codes. Um, you also have to have a, a fire escape plan um, and you have to provide an emergency number of a responsible party here in Vermont. Um, so it can't be someone in um, British Columbia, for example. Um, enforcement would be um, if someone is found in violation of the of the ordinance, they would be fined $40 a day um, and it would be like a parking ticket it would accumulate. Um, and the rentals would be subject subject to inspection by the city. Um, so we didn't talk about an effective date in in the housing committee, but um, one of the councilors suggested <laughs> we should have one. Um, so I would recommend you give it three months to go into effect. Um, so anything that is any any rentals that are already on the calendar would it would have time give them time to um, move them through. And so this would go into effect the third full month after the council passed the ordinance. Um, the second piece of the ordinance or the, of the recommendation, um, which is very separate from this underlying policy, we do not want the underlying policy to get caught up in this more complicated um, proposal. Um, so when we talk about housing Montpelier, a big question that always, always repeatedly comes up is how do we pay for it? Um, and we have a housing trust fund. Um, so this recommendation would be to increase the um, the uh, local option ta tax, specifically on short-term rentals, um, following Burlington's um, uh, model of 8%. So an increase of 8% on the local option tax. Um, we asked the city manager um, if we have, if we're allowed it within our charter um, to implement implement a tax, um, and it's it's not clear. And the research that I've seen in the last couple of days actually shows that it's I, I believe it's just Barry and Burlington that do have this allowance. Um, so you'd have to go. We would recommend you go to the um, the city voters. And, and ask them if they would like to pursue a charter change with the legislature. Um, so this tax would, I just wanna be clear, we're not taxing the person who owns the building. Um, we are asking the people who come and live, come in and visit our town to pay an increased tax. Um, owners can set up a gross receipts tax account with the city and remit taxes monthly. Um, they are welcome to pass those taxes on to their guests um, and revenue from the tax could um, cover the cost of administering the program and benefit the housing trust fund. And I believe that's it. Happy to take okay. any questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, start with council members in person. I will also point out for all of you in uh, out in, in Zoom land who are watching council members scramble around, um, a message popped up on the screen that uh, the battery is is running out and that led all the council members to run to pull, plug their co computers in. Although I think it was uh, the computer that was hosting the uh, slideshow that was actually running out of power. Um, but Anyone here, here in the room who'd like uh, on the council would like to start with some questions. Or uh, Donna or Pellin. Yes, Donna. Well, well and one of my questions, and I didn't do the research, was how different this is than how B and Bs are treated. So it's my understanding that B and B's have uh, are licensed, have a zoning allowance in the city, and I would defer to city employers to, to make that um, to to elucidate that. But that's my understanding. 
might be something you want to look into and compare the two of their recommendations and what's going on there and, and balance that difference. But I like most of the suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. So um, to be clear, it, in the definitions, um, the definitions are clear that it does not, um, it does not impact um, uh, inns, hotels, and Airbnbs. B&Bs. I'm sorry, B&Bs. B&Bs. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, can I just say one more point? Mm -hmm. um, the When we were taking public comment in the housing committee, um, I just want to have all the all the information on the table. Someone came to us um, that has an, uh, an Airbnb in town. Um, he used it to... Um, to bring the, the rent down on his long-term rentals. Um, and he said that by taking away this, um, this ability for him to have a, an Airbnb, it would impact the affordability of long-term rentals. Uh, we did talk at length about um, how to narrow the scope enough that um, it's very clear what we're regulating. Um, Burlington has a very broad, um, a swath of what they allow of of what they allow um and they do have an affordability clause um you are welcome to look into it and see if you are if you'd like to um if you want if you'd like to create that here um the concern is that when you start doing carve outs it's gonna um impact the long you know the overall um thrust of this project which is to create more long-term housing so but i want to just raise that um, Rebecca, when I was on the housing task force, we spent a, a bit of time looking at this question and talking about what the impact was. And as you said, one of the tricky things is finding data on, uh, on what's going on. And as I recall, one of the issues was that all of the, uh, all of the listings were listed under zip code 05602. And so it potentially took in places in uh, Berlin, uh, Middlesex and so forth. Is that still the case or were you able to uh, get uh, break that out more? So I would defer to Josh. Um, he had a conversation this morning that gave us some more clarity on the numbers. Hi, Josh Jerome, Community and Economic Development Specialist for the City. Um, they are able to break it into just um, Montpelier boundaries. So um, there are host compliance platforms out there, and they're able to identify all the listings within a particular community. So, yes. So the 78 or whatever it was, those are all within the city limits of Montpelier? Yep. Okay, thanks. Any other members of the council have any, uh, Sal? Uh, what, what happens to um, ex existing non-homestead short-term rentals? They are welcome to turn their short-term rentals into long-term rentals, or they can sell. I couldn't hear that. What did she say? They're welcome to turn their short-term rentals into long-term housing, or they are welcome to sell. Um, but I feel like we need to draw a line in the sand and say that we are going to prioritize people that live here and whose kids go to our schools and who volunteer and who um, participate in our community. And I think, you know, I think a, a big part of um, just to give you perspective of why I came, why I joined the housing committee. Um, it was because I was supporting a, working with a, a refugee family and we had you know five families that we couldn't find housing for that live here, that are embedded in our community, that are so dear to us. And we could not find housing for them for a very long time. And it got very scary that we were gonna have to, we're gonna lose these families that have been, that have become so dear to us. Um, and it's really, it doesn't feel like it is appropriate to um, prioritize investors over people who are beloved in our community. Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Um, the question was on housing committee, so it's part of all these conversations. But um, but to what the last thing that you just said, 
the thing for me that is really striking about this is the the idea of people buying up a, an entire property with the intention of renting it out as a short-term rental, um, as opposed to renting it out as a long-term rental, as opposed for someone to actually be able to live there. And I think that, I mean, we haven't, again, we don't have quite have all the information, but I think just from living in Montpelier, it seems to me that we have a much greater need for permanent housing for people than we do for uh, places for visitors to stay for a few days at a time. And we have hotels and we have inns and we have bed and breakfasts. And I, I mean, I would rather encourage more development of those for the people who wanna come and visit for short term and then try to keep as much of our housing available for people to actually live in as we can. So I think that, I also think that just based on looking at Airbnb listings, a whole lot of those 78 would be exempt under this because they are people renting out parts of their homes or their whole homes. And so so I so I think that this is a good balance of still allowing people who live here who want to make a little bit of extra money with the extra space that they have to be able to do that. Um, and at the same time, try to protect some of our housing stock to actually stay as long-term housing. Yep, I'm, I'm not committee with um, so my thoughts, because I study the housing market continuously, and it's kind of a wonky thing for me, but I haven't seen the trend with investors buying properties for this purpose. I know it's happening in other places. Um, I've been watching for it. It's really hard to identify that that's a trend here. And I do think you're right that a lot of the folks that have Airbnbs that are in their home aren't going to be impacted. So in the end, I think we're really going to free up very few units. And for missions to create more housing, this isn't a great use of time, in my opinion. I mean, I appreciate the sentiment, but um, it feels to me like it's a fairly involved proposal. Um, and I think the cost to administer it really hasn't been looked into yet, but it will take admin time and follow up. And, and I'm not sure the $110 a year fee is going to impact what it really costs. So I think that's something to be wary of as we look at our, our resources as a community. Um, I think it, I favor rental registries. I think there are aspects of this that I think are good and would help. And I think the safety code issues um, that go with the registry make a lot of sense to me. But that's my quick take. But Tim, I got a question for you uh, that, that reminds me of uh, when there's a when there's a real estate sale is uh, is there some declaration of whether the property is being purchased for homestead or something else? Not that I know. So we, so we, even if we went and looked at all the real estate transactions in the last year or two, we wouldn't be able to identify which ones are being bought for it. I don't think so. Okay. And it's interesting because as we go through the sales every year, Steve Twombly, the previous assessor, used to call me and probably other brokers at the end of the year because you really have to almost know the people and have a sense of what the transaction was. So I think he would call for anecdotal information that way. I always mm -hmm. thought they were interesting conversations, but that's how it was gathered. Uh -huh. So just to be clear, every one of the, in, in our presentation, every one of the pictures were investor owned short-term rentals. So, I mean, the, 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 the one, the last one is a three unit in College Street. It's three units that could be um, long-term housing. Um, another two are on, on, um, it's a duplex on Berlin Street. Another one is a house that I lived in when I first moved back to Montpelier in 2007 um, on the corner of Liberty Street. Um, the, these are not figments of my imagination. Um, and even if we change five houses into long-term houses, those are five houses that my um, refugee families could have more quickly moved into. Um, I think it is I think it is um, not doing our due diligence to say, I don't know about it. So it's it's something that we should just um, ignore. Okay, thanks. Perlin, uh, you'll, you'll be unmuted and then you can get in. Okay, you should be, oh, there you go. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, thank you for the presentation. What if uh, this investor wanna 
switch to their situation and have Airbnb. So in this proposal, are we offering something better mm -hmm. for them? Or, you know, they said, okay, since Airbnbs are like exempted, I will just be one of them and I will not do anything mm -hmm. I'm being asked. Thank you. Um, they would be paying the taxes and they would be carrying that burden by themselves. Um, I mean, I don't know about all of you, but my taxes are about $6,000 this year. That's a lot to carry if you're not living in the house and you're not um, subsidizing with rentals. So it's a, it's a personal decision that each one would make. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, uh, Palin, go ahead. And could we leave her unmuted? Yeah, uh, no, uh, thank you. So my point is, even if they pay taxes, if they switch to um, Airbnb, we will still not have available housing or units to our residents. That's what my point. So then we cannot solve the problem of housing. We are just helping investors to switch their profit from one thing to another. That was my point, so. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think I think the, uh, Rebecca misspoke when she said they could do an Airbnb, but we do have a bed and breakfast as a licensure. And, and so someone could invest and create a bed and breakfast. So I get your point there. Um, Thank you. So, Lauren. I I generally like this proposal. I kind of just appreciated Carrie's points. I mean, it's good to hear there's components of rental registry and code enforcement that maybe could get unanimous support. <laughs> um, I mean, to me, it just seems like there's this is the kind of problem that we need like a many faceted um, ways to tackle it, and this is you know, likely a, a small piece, but it seems like given the 0.0% .0 vacancy rate, you know, every unit that we can bring online seems helpful and knowing how challenging it is to build housing and to, you know, take the other steps that we also need to be doing, but take a while. So, you know, and I think we could learn a lot from the data, um, you know, and I think we could always scale it. So if we learn once we start collecting the data um, that there's, better ways to approach it in terms of a policy or even simplifying it. If it turns out it's not getting at a core problem, I'd rather be trying to do this um, and trying to address the problem. So I, I appreciate it. I guess one question just in the vein of like, how does this fit within what you all are seeing? So beyond pursuing projects for building new housing, are there other policies? Is, it, is this part of like a package you all are looking at? Or is this kind of like the low hanging fruit thing that a number of communities are doing and could kind of be implemented quickly. So this is kind of the, the first initial step, just to really how this fits within what you all are thinking about. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, as you know, <laughs> governments move very slowly. And um, we have been in the housing committee, you know, we created the housing committee last July. I said, we can have this proposal to the city council by Thanksgiving of 2022. <laughs> <laughs> it is now a year later. There's a lot more. I mean, just the wrangling around the homestead question, or you know, how how to. It, there's just so many questions, and um, public policy moves like molasses in winter. Um, so this is one. There's a bunch of sub subcommittees that are working on different projects. Um, this is the one that I said this could we could do this immediately. So let's do it now. <laughs> but yes, there's there are others, but this is the first. So hopefully we'll see more. Thanks. Okay, to be clear, what's on? Uh, go ahead, Donna. Well, you can make your statement first, Jack. No, it's it's fine. You, I'll, okay. It's a good time after you speak. Well, I, I was going to actually make a motion that we move towards this and we work on a, a an ordinance draft. Okay, so that's a motion. Is there a second? Okay, thank you. Now, this tees me up exactly where I was going to go, Donna, which is that we're not moving this ordinance tonight, but uh, we are looking, and we're not, nothing's getting passed tonight, but we are looking to see if there's support on the council to 
pursue uh, the an ordinance uh, adoption process. I know there are people present in the room and possibly um, uh, online who'd like to be heard on this before we uh, before we vote. So I'll start with people in the uh, in the room who are interested in speaking to this topic. And Dan, do you want to step up? Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Josh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Dan Lanier from uh, Upper Main Street here in Montpelier. And I want to offer um, something from the perspective of, of uh, a homeowner who is, who is renting through Airbnb. Um, we have a garage building. Half of it is finished space. When we, uh, the previous owners uh, used it as an office, we found out that after we had purchased the place, we didn't need it as an office, and it was contrary to zoning regulations to uh, rent it out to another, a third, to somebody else. Uh, then we came up with this Airbnb thing, and we've been doing that for a few years. Um, we're retired. We're living on Social Security. We're in a house that's too big. We would like to stay in Montpelier. We love the community. Uh, as Tim can tell you, there's almost nothing available in terms of small houses unless you want to be in the flood zone or you want to be at the bottom of Liberty Street for over half a million dollars. Nice little ranch house there beyond our means. So uh, we would like to be able to keep the Airbnb operating. Uh, we have It's a small unit. Um, we rent it for $80 a night. Uh, very modest. Most of our rentals, well over half, are for just one night. So we have a cleaning fee. They have to pay that. Cleaning fee apply, applies whether you're renting for a day or a month, <clears throat> but most of them are very short-term rentals. Uh, my concern is that um, although our rental fee posted is $80, by the time people, our guests come in and they're paying all the various taxes and fees, it's approximately 108, excuse me, $151. I'm very concerned that by adding a, um, hmm, what do we call it? A, uh, um, yeah, the local option tax rate uh, of 8%. I'm, I'm concerned that that uh, increase will um, impact our ability to continue to rent the place um, for the modest fee that we do. I don't want to boost the, uh, I don't want to bump our fees up because, again, we're attracting people, uh, good people, you know, um, that are visiting neighbors, visiting family, and so on. Uh, and I'm uh, very concerned that the additional fees will cut into our ability to keep renting the place, which cuts into our ability to pay our taxes and stay in this house and um, our ability to stay in Montpelier, uh, ultimately. So thanks for taking that into consideration. Okay, thanks. Anybody else here in the room who wants to be heard on this topic? Rick. Yeah, I guess for my own edification, like a point of clarification about where we're at. Um, the motion, as I understood it, only pertains to the 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 ordinance to regulate bare BBs. I don't. Did you do? Did the motion didn't include the eight percent tax issue? Right? Is it or am I wrong about that? The, the motion was to explore it further. Explore the develop. ordinance. I wrote down that it was yes. to explore the ordinance. So I'm just, you know, Mr. Lindner was just talking about the eight percent tax, which yep. would be the charter change. So I just, I, I, I just want to make sure that I'm keeping track of the right thing. I, I think you're right. I think there's a difference between the ordinance and the charter change. Is that okay. what you think, Donna? Uh, yes, certainly. We can see. We, I can clarify that the intention is to look at the ordinance, and we'll deal with the tax later. Should the ordinance happen? Thanks. Okay. Right. Hi, uh, Rick DeAngelis. Uh, I live at 5 Emmons Street. I'm also the director of the Good Samaritan Haven. I think it's very telling uh, the first two items on the agenda tonight, the first being the report from the Homelessness Task Force. And, uh, you know, we don't collect data about how many people have been displaced from their apartments because of conversion to short term rentals. But we've certainly, it's anecdotal, there have been a number of those situations. And um, there's no question that that end of the rental market is drying up. Um, I was surprised, and uh, maybe they had it, but um, 
the Vermont uh, Housing Finance Agency just released a major report on the growth of short-term rentals, just came out a few weeks ago. It's really stunning. Uh, there was a dramatic increase, especially in the last year. In Washington County alone, over the last nine years, uh, there's been an increase of over a thousand short-term rentals. Okay, so sure, maybe a few of those units were built new, but um, uh, I, I've got to believe that most of them were not. So, I, you know, I would probably be in favor of, of a even broader brushstroke on this, but I think this is a good start. Thanks, Rick. Um, Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Oprowski. I feel like I had to speak after speaking in between both of my neighbors here. <laughs> um, I'm a renter on Main Street, right between Dan and Rick. And I really hope that you guys can consider this recommendation because this is really important. Um, as a renter that was looking for a new property to rent a little over a year ago, I got really scared that I wasn't going to be able to stay in Montpelier because I could not find anything. Luckily, I found a building that was a single family home that was now converted into three units. And we're really grateful to be here. My son is a successful student at the high school here, but I wouldn't have been able to. And I'm terrified to find out if my, if I can't renew a re lease again, because there's just not rentals. And um, thinking about what Tim said, not having, maybe there's not a lot of people that are investing or buying investment properties for this. We're such a small community that even if there's 25 houses that could fit maybe five, a five member family, that's a significant number in such a small community. Like we would probably, most of us would know those people. So I think that it's really important that we do limit our short-term rentals. Um, and if it comes to a tax later, just thinking about a quick 8% on $80 is not that much. It's like $7 maybe a night. So I think that somebody could take on that. Somebody that's visiting could take on that extra 8% tax. I don't think it's going to be too much, but that's just all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Anybody else here in the room? Yes, Emma. Hi. Ooh, <laughs> my voice sounds bad. Um, my name is Emma Zavez. I live at 3 Derby Drive in Montpelier, and I'm also the chair of the Montpelier Housing Committee. Um, so first, I just wanted to thank Rebecca for her presentation and the committee members for their really hard work on this, as she said, it's been more than a year that they have been researching, reaching out to other communities, um, talking to experts on this issue and crafting a, a proposal. So that's that's a lot of energy and time um, and commitment. Um, and, and yes, this is, I think Lauren, you asked, this is one of many initiatives that we are bringing forth and you will be hearing more from us in the coming months. Um, and I think that that is part and parcel of the fact that, and I think you said this too, that that there will be uh, it's not just one initiative that is going to solve the housing crisis, in quotes. Um, we need all solutions, big and small, everything counts. Um, and I guess um, I wrote a bunch of stuff, <laughs> but I feel like everyone's already, already said it, which is great. I guess the only thing I wanted to highlight was just that I think that, you know, communities across the country have been grappling with the issue of having a housing crisis um, for, for a long time now. Famously, San Francisco, uh, New York City, um, also two communities that are regulating short-term rentals um, where uh, demand is high, supply is scarce, housing costs are wildly unaffordable, and there is a huge unhoused population. Um, and we're seeing the same thing happen in Vermont. I was going back through some Seven Days articles on short-term rental regulation and one published earlier this year mentioned 14 different communities in Vermont um, that have either begun regulating short-term rentals or are taking the steps necessary to begin regulating short-term rentals. Um, so famously, we think of Burlington, who's more recently enacted this, um, but many other smaller communities as well. Um, 
And so while while we might not uh, see as many short-term rentals yet or investor opportunities as Tim mentioned, um, I think that the tide is is just beginning. Um, I think Montpelier is in a new place. We have arrived. We are in a housing crisis. Um, uh, we have lots of unsheltered people. We have lots of people uh, working here who can't afford or find a place, even if they could afford a place to live. Um, so we need to be looking at every opportunity to resolve the issue. Um, so similarly, I don't know how many housing units, it's impossible to know how many of the short-term rentals in the community would be affected by this um, in terms of not, no longer being allowed. But I think that every every unit of housing counts at this moment, um, especially because these units exist right now, they're ready right now and could be uh, long-term year-round housing for community members. And finally, I just wanna say that I think that this is a an important moment for Montpelier to uh, publicly sort of identify itself as being a community where people live. Um, I think a lot of communities are struggling um, with investors buying up houses and turning them into short-term rentals. And you can see that's your time. Oh, that's my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Emma. I hope that you will pass this proposal. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. I, I was just wondering if, uh, if the speaker would be able to see it, but then I looked and saw, there you were, Donna, holding it up. Excellent. Um, so anyone else in the room who would like to be heard on this, or is there anyone on Zoom who would like to be heard? If so, please raise your electronic hand or your physical hand. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Mike, Mike followed by Dan, and uh, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, thank you, council members. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, members of the housing task force. Um, you know, you, you all put in a ton of time on this and every other important issue that we face. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I strongly support the proposed ordinance. Um, Short-term rentals are, are like an extractive form of economic activity that will not uh, kind of build the base that our town needs. We need um, we need long term rentals. So I I think this is a good step in that direction. Um, I was glad that Tim said he's not seeing a lot of evidence of short term you know rental investors yet in Montpelier. Although the data that Rick cited kind of cuts the other way. But I would much rather see us get ahead of this issue than wait until it becomes you know the kind of uh, extractive economic practice that actually erodes the the kind of basic uh, economic infrastructure we need to have a prosperous community, um, you know, housing being really at the base of that pyramid. So um, yeah, that's it. I strongly support the ordinance and thank you everyone for your work. Thanks, Mike. Um, Dan Kopak. Kopak. Uh, hi, my name is Dan Kopik. I live on Barry Street, and um, I would also like to echo what the last speaker said um, and thank everybody involved in bring, bringing the proposal forward. Um, I also strongly support um, the proposals. Um, Vermont has lowest um, rental vacancy rate and the highest uh, or the second highest overall vacancy rate due mainly to camp second homes and short-term rentals. Um, so I, I, I do think it's not just a Montpelier problem. It's a, it's a statewide problem. Um, and I'm glad that Montpelier is, is um, considering um, taking, um, uh, taking this proposal on, on short-term housing. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And Diane Sherman. It'll take a moment to get you muted or unmuted, and then looks like you should be ready to go. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Diane Sherman. I'm also a member of the, I'm sorry, my video is so red. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I'm also a member of the housing committee. I'll keep this brief. Um, I'm strongly in favor of this ordinance. And the reason I wanted to speak is principally because this ordinance would have a direct effect on me. Um, I've recently moved away from Montpelier simply because my partner has a job about two hours from Montpelier. And so I now own a house in Montpelier, which is not my homestead. 
Um, and just to be clear, I will be stepping down from the housing committee because I think it's important to have local folks on it. So we'll have two vacancies for anybody listening. Um, but I believe that there are viable options for folks who have second homes in Montpelier and long-term rental, long-term renting them long-term is the most obvious one, which is exactly what we need in Montpelier. We need long-term housing. Um, another viable option for folks who do spend some time in their homes is uh, renting, as we talked about, to legislators for the time period in which they're here and then to folks like traveling nurses and other folks who are in town for short-term employment uh, engagement. And so I do believe there are very viable options for folks who own second homes. Thanks. Stay in. Um, scanning the, uh, the Zoom list and I'm not seeing any other hands popping up. Anything else or are we ready for vote? Okay, the the motion is to uh, pursue the uh, process of uh, uh, an ordinance for regulating short-term rentals. Um, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Next up, Montpelier Resiliency Commission. Come on up then. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna see if I can get my computer plugged in because it looks like, I, looks like I'm running out of power. And Sal is back. So Ben, you're on. Thanks for being here. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Ben Doyle. Uh, I live in the um, on Chapman Road, just up the street. And um, I'm here tonight representing the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. And I, I just want to say thanks for having me and thanks for for your service and leadership uh, at City Council. So I thought, I mean, you tell me what would be helpful for you, but I was thinking maybe I just start with five minutes talking about like, what is this commission? Where did it come from? And what are its goals and what are we doing? And then just to open it up for any kind of questions that you folks might have. So I, I might just say a little bit uh, about me. Um, I'm the, in my day job, I'm the president of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, which is a nonprofit organization that builds community through the preservation of historic buildings, villages, and downtowns. In my previous role, I worked at USDA Rural Development, um, which is a federal agency focused on rural economic vitality. And so, you know, I was particularly interested uh, after the flood of being involved in trying to think about community resiliency, economic development, community development, how do we come through something like this? Um, and so I was pleased to participate in the series of community forums. I know many of you were there that were convened really by Paul Costello in partnership uh, with the Montpelier Foundation, Montpelier Live, the city of Montpelier. Um, you know, I uh, frankly kind of owe my career to following Paul Costello around. And uh, I probably participated in, I, I would say 25 to 30 community visit processes uh, with the Vermont Council on Rural Development over the past decade. And I've never been to one like the one that was in Montpelier with that kind of engagement. I mean, I think we talked about almost a thousand people were involved in those forums, which I found really inspiring. Um, and, you know, uh, there were a number of priorities that were identified. I, uh, I shared the list with you. It, it's available online. Um, one of the things that came up was the idea of uh, the need for a kind of independent entity that could um, really focus on moving kind of these priorities forward. You know, that um, it's great to have 24 priorities or ideas, but if there's nobody there to do them, um, you're not going to get them done. And you can pick 24 things and get none of them done, or you can pick four and assemble leadership around them and try to make something happen. And so one of the priorities that was identified was the need for this commission and um, continuing the kind of work of community in the forums, the Montpelier Foundation, Montpelier Alive in the city um, decided to um, form this commission, uh, put out uh, a call for applications and um, people applied and were selected by the founding partners. Uh, it's a 15 member commission. Um, um, the list of who's on the commission is included in the charge document, which I shared with you 
earlier. Um, I'm actually serving as chair of the commission. Uh, I was appointed as chair by my fellow commission members. It's one of those things where it's, um, you know, uh, first prize is to be on a commission, second prize is to chair it. And, uh, but I'm really happy to do it. And Lauren also serves on the commission and um, really brings an important perspective and think of the liaison uh, with the council and um, Bill's been uh, excellent in uh, helping support and coordinate um, and provide information and context with what the city's approach is. So in terms of the commission, what it is and what it does, you know, it's uh, we're not any kind of official authority or anything like that. It's not a public governing body. It's really a group of 15 volunteers with a variety, wide variety of expertise and experience who are interested in uh, helping move the priorities that were identified at those community forums forward. And you know, um, the way we've described it is using the members of the commission's knowledge, connections, and leadership, um, the commission works to surface opportunities for public and private investment, policy initiatives, and action-oriented partnerships that will increase Montpelier's resiliency. I think if you look at who's on this commission, there are a number of people who have experience in community and economic development work, people who have had various roles in state government, people who are involved in watershed management, um, people who are currently working on those issues in the state of Vermont, people in renewable energy or natural resources. Uh, it's really, uh, and we have some, you know, some young people on the commission. It's really a broad sector of people that have the expertise to try and move some of these things forward. Um, and so what I would say is, you know, that's kind of what the commission is. And I think what we're in, you know, we've had three meetings. Um, and I just want to say right up the get-go, you know, as a practitioner of community and economic development, this is the work of decades, not months or even years. And, you know, I think we're really looking at this as a kind of long term. Uh, this is not we're not envisioning ourselves as a long term recovery group in the same way that Barry Up is, you know, which is really focused on individual assistance and, and kind of case management of people who have been impacted. This is really, I think, more about long term visioning and project management and you know accelerating good ideas for future long-term resiliency that includes like helping to stand up or support long-term recovery groups that can help individual assistance but i just want to be clear about the distinction of what what we're talking about um i you know i think we think of ourselves uh, at the commission if it works well can serve as an accelerant to good ideas it can serve as a kind of lubricant to ideas that have been stuck for a long time but that would make a, a positive impact and you know again as a practitioner of community economic development i can say that the difference between communities that are successful and communities that aren't successful it really comes down to collaborative collaborative visionary leadership that's relentlessly optimistic you know and i think that the people on this commission love montpelier i love montpelier that's what we care about. None of us have a political agenda or an axe to grind. We just really want to see good things happen in Montpelier. So I want to talk about what the commission isn't. Uh, it's not an entity seeking to co-opt the work of the city or this council. Uh, we're not a body with a political agenda, and we're not naive. We know that this is going to be a, a long game and take a lot of work. Um, but I think we, we need to take that approach to address the challenges that we face. And so to get really granular of like, what does this work actually look like? You know, I think we're, again, we've met three times. I think we're figuring it out. We're taking a look at the 20 different priorities that came up from the forums. We're taking a look at the community capacity and systems that exist right now and trying to kind of line up those priorities with the systems of the capacity or the people on the commission and think about, all right, how do we move some of those things forward? So, you know, specifically what we're envisioning thus far are things like learning from other communities, right? Talking to folks who experienced flooding during Irene, places like Waterbury that had similar long-term recovery efforts, learning from other communities about response, recovery, and collecting that information and, and thinking about how does it apply to Montpelier. Um, looking for opportunities to share best practices and resources to build resilient infrastructure. Convening groups uh, or people working on long-term individual assistance recovery. Um, creating opportunities for future engagement. I think one of the things that's going to be really key for this commission is, you know, like I said before, we don't have any kind of official authority. The only energy or power that's going to come to this group is through the commitment it has from the public, right? Of, I think people will see either it'll be successful or it won't, and that is, that is the kind of authority. And so we view it as like a real partnership with the community. Like we are trying to serve the priorities that they identified. And um, so we have this real commitment to wanting to communicate and to collaborate with folks in the community. That'll involve a series of kind of community engagement processes. Uh, I think it, this work involves convening state, federal, philanthropic partners to find creative approaches to financing infrastructure. 
and resiliency repair. You know, again, a number of the people on the commission kind of do that kind of work in their day jobs, and it becomes an opportunity to, to take that to our hometown. Uh, also looking at opportunities for watershed restoration, recognizing that the watershed is much, much larger than what's here in Montpelier, and that there are going to be really important partnerships across the Winooski watershed that are going to be important. Certainly folks like the Regional Planning Commission are going to play a key role in that, but it's important for Montpelier to have a voice and to be able to um, leverage the opportunities that are here to further that work and to work again with you know partners like UVM who've already reached out that are looking to bring their expertise to bear to kind of help in some of those issues. And then, um, you know, I would say advocacy, uh, I think is really important. You folks all have a lot on your plate. And, um, you know, my experience working with the federal government is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And, you know, I think it's really important for a group of citizens to just continually be advocating um, for resources and attention to help with the long-term recovery. A very specific example, you know, yesterday, a group of commission members, along with Bill, um, met with uh, representatives from all of the congressional delegations to talk about the, the future of the federal building and the post office and the real kind of concerns of what's happening here. You know, I mean, I think in some respects, it could seem like a minor issue or a minor inconvenience, but it's really not. You know, the federal building in Montpelier is the the premier symbol of the federal involvement in our capital. And it's a real important symbol of does the federal government believe in this place or does it not? And, um, you know, similarly, the post office is the federal agency that we most naturally interact with on a daily basis. And it needs to be downtown to demonstrate a commitment to this place. And I, you know, maybe it sounds crazy, but I really believe we could lead the nation with having the most flood resilient federal building and uh, post office in the country. And we should go for that. You know, and I would just say another kind of a specific example, again, is like trying to convene different community service organizations or community members who are who are interested in that individual assistance. We've had some meetings with the Agency of Human Services and FEMA talking about what that could look like and trying to identify other folks in the community that want to lead that work. And then finally, and, you know, I think perhaps they'll jump in here if, if uh, you know, I think we're going to talk about this perhaps at future meetings. But you know, I think one of the things that will be really exciting about this commission is when you bring people together that are doing different kinds of work in their day jobs or have different kinds of experiences, these kinds of accidental connections can happen that really can create forward movement. And so, for example, um, I've been involved in a project for a very long time down at Five Farm, uh, Farm Home Way, the building, the property down by Agway. Um, uh, my, the organization that I works for maintains a historic preservation easement on the house that's there in partnership with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board that has a conservation easement on that property. Um, I think you've probably been all, I don't know if you all have, but there's, it's been a long challenging history with that property. Um, and it's kind of been an illegal quagmire for years. Um, and, you know, recently there was some, you know, really dangerous activity that, that happened on that property. And I think, you know, Bill can attest to the fact for years, people have been trying to kind of crack this nut to figure out a way to move that property forward. You know, it really, as a result of the commission, it was an opportunity to sit with folks from the city, to sit with the state hazard mitigation officer, to look at that as a new kind of opportunity to think about watershed management. You know, there's 15 acres of property there right along the river that's in the floodway that has the opportunity to really provide some flood plain restoration. And, um, you know, really as a result of conversations that originated around that table, you know, we've been able to get kind of all of the partners that are involved in that challenge, including, you know, um, city management, uh, the, an adjoining property owner, the Vermont, uh, um, community loan fund that has a mortgage on that site, my organization, the Preservation Trust, and VHCB. We've all agreed that there's an opportunity here using the state's um, buyout program that we might be able to um, find a way to unencumber that property with the mess that it is right now and kind of move it forward as, a, as one piece, just one small piece of a much larger kind of watershed question, right? And, and, and restoring that land to... Um, um, to floodplain that it can absorb water and protect historic properties downtown Montpelier. So that, you know, that's not an, an official project of the commission. It's one that the commission might choose to support in the future. But I, I envision over the life of the commission, opportunities like that arising um, from the conversations that will be had around that table and from the partners and from the community that will share ideas. Uh, you know, I think that the last thing I just want to say is like, 
none of the ideas that we have or the priorities that the community identified are going to be able to be moved forward without incredible partnership from the city. You know, uh, I know a number of the city employees um, kind of in a professional context and the great work that they're doing and that there are projects that they're a part of that I really feel like this commission, again, could help accelerate or or move forward and um, would really, I think we're all welcoming the opportunity to partner with you to be useful um, to the city and to the city council. And um, as I said before, you know, I, I think all of us on the, on the council are or on the commission, we're, we're not naive, but I, I think we're relentlessly optimistic and just really look forward to doing this work. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you folks have. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for everything you're doing for all your work on this and to you and all the other members of the commission. Um, any one on the council have any questions? Donna. I got a question from a constituent wanting to know how the public knows where you're meeting so they can participate. They were a bit concerned that everyone that's a member has like an official title associated with the situation and they don't see any general public people there. So that's two questions, I guess. One is you're talking a lot about public involvement and partnership, but at least one constituent was concerned that when they reached out, they were told there wouldn't be open to public to, uh, your meetings. So maybe you can clarify that. Yeah, I mean, we're not an official body of the city or uh, like a city commission, right? Or uh, um, the housing task force, for example. This is this is different. This is a group of, mm -hmm. of individuals who stepped up to be a part of this kind of task force. And as such, you know, the, the, we're not having, we're not subject to open meeting laws. We're not having uh, regularly, op you know, or I shouldn't say regularly, but, you know, we're meeting every two weeks at this point and not all of those meetings are open to the public. We definitely do envision having at least quarterly large convenings where the community can come and, and be in dialogue with the commission. We're reporting out uh, our conversations on a regular basis, um, you know, in various communication methods, including front porch forum. And, you know, we have a website, Montpelier Strong uh, website. There's a platform there. Uh, there's an email address, Montpelier Flood Commission. Um, you know, and I would also say, I know that there are a lot of people on the, the list of commissioners that have like official titles, but they're all like our neighbors. Right. And so I would really encourage you to, to reach out to them and say, hey, what are you doing on this commission? We want to know more. I have this idea like we're, we're really we really do mean it that we want to be engaged with the public. But we also want to be able to have, frankly, pretty challenging conversations in a kind of safe environment where we can think about strategically. And um, and again, you know, we're not elected officials. We're just folks that are getting together to try and, and do something good. Yes, Karen. Um, thank you for that. Can you? Clarify a little bit. I may have missed a little of what you said because I was trying to find yeah. the website. Yeah. Um, so I didn't find it going through the city or just Googling, but then when you said it was Montpelier Strong. Yeah, it should it. be much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so you've had some meetings, um, but you don't have like minutes from your meetings or notes from your meetings on here. There's no, I don't see any sort of summary of what you're what you've done at your meeting so far. So how are you going to be communicating? Yeah, they should be on know? there. I'm sorry that they're not. We we have been disseminating them through Front Porch Forum and through an email list of people that um, shared their emails at the community forums. Um, but the idea is that they'll uh, be available on the website. Okay. Great. Anyone else? Ooh, Sal, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Ben. I. I have a lot of faith in uh, the wisdom of crowds. So I'm, there was a pretty big crowd in, in those forms that we did. And then to have 15 or 16 members of the commission with such varied backgrounds makes good sense to me. Um, you know, every time something um, about development downtown comes up, I think of what about, you know, what are we gonna do with the river? Um, where is that on the priority list? I mean, I, I just feel like something i mean do we need to create a sponge or can we leave things you know what can we leave the way it is what do we have to worry about maybe changing before we build anything uh permanent um so i'm curious about where that is on the priority list yeah i mean i i think it's it's right up there right and i but I, I just want to be really clear, too, that I think all of us are coming to this work with a sense of curiosity, mm. right? Like definitely a recognition. I mean, the two 
from my perspective, the two major issues are like, how do we adapt the buildings that we have in downtown and how do we reimagine our relationship with the river? Mm -hmm. Right. Those two things. I mean, and they're totally, they're not siloed. They're totally interconnected. But um, so one part of your question is where is that on the priority list? I, it's front and center. What the answer is, you know, I think is really going to take time, curiosity and expertise that, you know, I, I don't have. Right. But I can listen well. And there are other people on that commission, you know, as I mentioned, the state hazard mitigation officer that helps m administer the FEMA and state buyout program for flood impacted properties. Or um, we have somebody that is a floodplain regulator for the state of Vermont that really understands watershed issues. So I feel like between the, the, the expertise that's there, and it's not that they have all the answers, but they know who to talk to or who to convene. To, to learn more about what are appropriate things. And, you know, it, it's not like the commission comes up with an idea of this is the future of downtown, make it so, right? It's really about helping people understand the interconnected nature of all of these different factors that are at play, and then looking for, you know, common understanding and opportunities to work together, right? I mean, for me, what I'm, I mean, just personally, like I'm fascinated by the, the recent, proposals in Barrie, uh, you know, around the governor's um, proposals about redevelopment of a neighborhood, including park space and all of those kinds of things. You know, that's really a lot of that's contingent on private landowners mm -hmm. uh, agreeing to voluntary buyouts. Um, but here in Montpelier, we have, you know, what, 40 percent of the downtown is asphalt, much of which is controlled by the state of Vermont, which is one property owner. You know, and I think that there's some probably some pretty interesting ways to engage the state in rethinking of how that land is used, uh, that really benefits everyone. Anybody else? Jack, there's one thing that I neglected to say that's super important. This is a volunteer commission. And, you know, one of our first goals is actually to hire a director, right? <laughs> it's like, I think a lot of us have ideas and want, wants to do things, but like operationalizing things, like getting the minutes on the website and, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and, and someone who can really kind of keep us on task, you know, I think a volunteer effort of this nature can burn out pretty quickly unless we have some, um, some paid staff. And so, um, you know, Montpelier Alive and Montpelier Foundation, uh, commission members individually were, were, were working pretty hard actually to fundraise for this position and to hire, you know, someone who is a rock star and relentless. Thanks, Ben. I see iPad Steve um, with his hand up. If you could be on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, thanks for the, to the uh, participants here. I had the same um, questions that Donna Steve? and Kerry touched on uh, just, regarding could, the commission. Sorry? Could you could you tell us who you are? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. I'm Steve Cease. I live on North Street um, in upper and out of the floodplain Montpelier. Um, and thanks to the um, commission, I did have the um, same concerns that Donna touched on. I was, I've been trying to find any information about the commission when does it meet where does it meet is it can people zoom in is it open to the public and the um the discussion so far indicates that really it's actually not open to the public i personally think that's a mistake i think that um the the commission would benefit from the ability to hear from people who are not members of the group and perhaps to throw in other ideas or different perspectives I know that the, there is a very expert group on the commission, but I really think that it's important to uh, for taxpayers, and, and I am uh, particularly interested in the subject, to have some access to the meetings and to have some input. So um, that's my point, and I hope that um, you and the commission will think about this and hopefully provide more public access to its proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I, I really do appreciate that. And, you know, I think uh, I'm not trying to make an excuse for it, but, you know, we've met three times and we're, we are still figuring out a lot of our, our processes. And um, I know that all of us are committed to um, really to service uh, the community here. And so community participation and perspective is going to be really important. And um, I, I thank you for those comments. Thank you. Ben is the, uh, 
is the job announcement and application process there on the no okay no we're reviewing the um position description next week and actively fundraising including tomorrow to try and get the money to pay for it okay lauren yeah thanks um just just first kind of in like one other thought that hasn't really been named about community participation is I mean, a big way that I see the commission's work rolling out is in subcommittees, the groups that are going to, for example, look at the watershed or look at the adaptive downtown. And I am positive that all of those groups, as you get into the topics, um, the hope, like we collected the names of the community forums of people who signed up with interest in specific issue areas, for example, so reaching back out to folks. So community engagement, I think, is very much a priority of everyone involved and and figuring out how, what that looks like for kind of a volunteer <laughs> commission is still a trick, but I do like, that's a place where I feel like people have really been um, envisioning a lot of engagement is once we're getting into, you know, right. It's so far been kind of setting up the processes and structures of this commission. And once we get into the meat of it and the, the fun stuff <laughs> of, you know, how we get towards solutions, I think it'll kind of naturally transition to a more community engagement um, phase, but. Um, I guess just uh, just while well, I'm talking. <laughs> um, so just for for the council and public, as a person who um, kind of raised my hand to serve and be hopefully a liaison for all of you, um, you know, and we'll be sitting here in a public forum every two weeks uh, for um, as council, like very much welcome and you know want to understand how I can best be. Um, keeping the council engaged and up to speed and bringing your ideas and thoughts, um, you know, or, or bringing folks into the process. So, you know, just open dialogue and welcome kind of feedback of how to do that effectively as we try to figure out structurally, um, you know, want to make sure that we're as aligned and communicative and, um, you know, everyone's aware of what we're doing and able to kind of be part of the process so things aren't coming out of left field in the commission, for example. And, you know, Bill's part of it too, or participating. He's not on the commission. He's um, bringing a city perspective. But, um, but yeah, I would welcome from, you know, public and fellow counselors how to do that well. Um, my role is actually the note taker. I'm, I'm the, the, minis, <laughs> the minutes taker at the meeting. That's what my role is. Uh, no, I just wanted, as a point of information, uh, if you go on the city's website, we have our our community portal with a bunch of projects. There's a whole flood page portal, and the information about the commission is all on there. The members, the charge, there was the commission did a written summary of the first meeting, and that's there. I don't know. We could actually post the notes. If, uh, no, we're we're actually we're going to provide written summaries. Yeah, so we do written summaries. So yeah. whatever the, you know, whatever the commission wants, we're you know, it isn't a city official city body, but we are using the city's website as well to per, to be a conduit for them to put information out. So and Evelyn's been coordinating that. So that is happening. So it can be found there as well. And on MontelierStrong.org. Right. So anybody else before we let let Ben go home? Chris, Chris Hancock. Okay. Chris, go ahead. You'll, once you're unmuted. Still look, still looks me. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself now, Chris? There you go. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, so it, it, you have to do it at both ends. You click something and I click something. That's how yes, it works. Yes, we have to give All you right. permission to unmute yourself. Then you unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Okay. Start good. Telling us who you are. Um, uh, another lesson in teamwork, which is what I want to talk about. Um, I'm uh, Chris Hancock and um, uh, live on Clarendon Ave. Um, I serve on my Pillars Recreation Board. Uh, I've been involved in various conversations about rec facilities over the years. Um, this is kind of a transitional comment uh, because I would like to note the connection between community recreation and community resilience. Um, during the aftermath of the flood in July, the Barry Street Gymnasium was temporarily converted to a warehouse 
for externally donated supplies. So that's one kind of connection. Our recreation facilities have the capacity to serve the community in other ways during emergencies. Um, and uh, if you think of a, a bigger community slash recreation center of the kind that I think Ken is, Ballard is going to be talking about, and hello, Ken, good to see you. Um, one thing you can do is imagine all the different ways that that kind of uh, building might be a vital resource during various kinds of future emergency situations. Um, the more subtle, but I think actually much more significant um, connection between recreation and resilience is the web of relationships that are developed through community recreation. I'll just use my own example. Um, my experience playing noontime basketball, I've gotten to know, I don't know, maybe 150 people, um, more people than through any other activity that I do here in town. Um, people from of more ages, from more walks of life uh, than I otherwise get to spend a lot of time with. Um, I've made some good friends, some good acquaintances, but in a way, just as important is the, that I've spent some quality time with people that wouldn't be friends. I might not even like them that much. Maybe I rub them the wrong way. Um, even with those people, I've had to work out a lot of issues, how to function together on a team, how to play fair as opponents. Uh, I don't know, you might have to play a contact team sport to understand all the potential for conflict, the need for cooperation, um, and even uh, sort of community self-governance, you know, deciding who gets to, who has to sit out, who's gonna play next, and which rules apply in this game, uh, all that stuff. Um, so I've probably, actually, I've learned how to be a better team player with, with anybody that I might meet, but in particular, if I'm thrown into an emergency situation with anyone from that community or any group from that community, we are way ahead of the game in terms of being a, ready to work together to do whatever we have to do. Um, so this is a topic that actually has been getting some attention, actually over the years, it goes back, I, I remember reading something about recreation from like 100 years ago that talked about uh, this connection. But uh, I'm looking here at a paper somewhat relevant from the uh, International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction. And they're talking about the connections between uh, it's just part of this work of connecting the dots from recreation to social networks, from social networks to resilience. Um, but I think it's also a pretty common sense idea that in recreation, we're getting to know each other better. We're becoming more deeply committed to the people around us. We're having fun together and we're practicing doing challenging things together. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I would like us to continue uh, to keep uh, recreation in mind as a significant, important value for our, for our town, even during these difficult times. And at several recent civic meetings, I've been troubled to hear from some fellow citizens some very dismissive comments about recreation and about recreation facilities, as though recreation is frivolous or optional or something that just doesn't require any civic investment. Um, community recreation provides many significant benefits to a community, including supporting some of our most important values and priorities. Resilience is one of those. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else? I don't wanna overlook anyone who has something you wanna say. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks for, Thanks for coming in. Um, now we ordinarily take uh, our break at 8.30, but we have uh, a couple of longish things coming up. So I think we should take it now so we don't have to interrupt those, uh, those next items. So 10 minutes. And their next item on our agenda is the Community Center Report with Ken Ballard. Do we have... Uh, any uh, kickoff, Bill? Arnie, this Arnie? has really been uh, their project, uh, so I'm going to hand it right over to you. I just wanted to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just wanted to introduce Ken Ballard, who's um, we have as our consultant for our operations plan and our study of the of the recreation um, facility. Um, and he's going to present the two options that he came up with on the opportunities that could could happen. Um, but this is strictly an operations plan, not a actual physical facility plan. So I will let Ken take it from there. Great, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, good evening again. I'm Ken Ballard. I'm one of the principals of Ballard King and Associates. We're a recreation planning firm and help uh, communities develop these types of projects. I'm gonna hopefully be able to share my screen here and I have a brief PowerPoint that'll take us through the high points of this. So let's see what we get. Uh, I guess I have to be authorized to share, so. It's coming. Okay. All right, here we go. I don't know if you can see, can you see the presentation? Yep. Okay, let me try to get this over to presentation. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, a little bit about us real quickly. We're, again, a recreation planning firm. We've been assisting communities on developing uh, community center projects for over 30 years. And uh, during this time, we've completed over 900 project studies uh, through all the United States. We've worked in all 50 states, and we have over 250 recreation facilities of some sort up and running around the country. And the vast majority of those are public facilities. And we've been involved in over 30 uh, New England projects. You'll see a few of them listed there, but uh, we do a lot of work in New England uh, on the East Coast and um, uh, really throughout the United States on these types of projects. So it's what we do. And uh, again, operation plans are our real specialty for these types of facilities. Uh, so what were our kind of study parameters? Uh, we looked, and uh, just as a point too, uh, we were involved in the last study that was very different in 2018 and 19, where we looked at uh, the possibility back then of um, Montpelier building some type of a recreation facility. We looked at the existing recreation center that you have, as well as a number of other facility options. So this is a, a change in the type of facility that was talked about, but we used some of the information that we had uh, from the previous study. So we update the mark, we updated the market analysis, and that really looked that demographics and certainly from the 2018 uh, time frame that we did the initial study till uh, this summer, uh, the you know number of changes have happened demographically. We also looked at sports participation trends as well. That kind of gave us the backdrop then for completing the operations analysis. Um, you'll see there was two different options that were brought forward. Uh, uh, the architect that uh, worked with the city and with Arnie developed some initial uh, concepts in terms of what might be included in this facility. Uh, we re helped them refine that a little bit, but that was the baseline uh, for then completing the operations analysis. And we looked at then uh, some assumptions, hours of operation, fee structure, and actually then itemized out the cost for expenses and revenues for the, for the project as best we know right now. So, uh, let's. I'm going to go through rather briefly the um, kind of highlights of some of the information that we developed. Uh, we identified uh, demographically uh, a primary service area, which is basically the city boundaries, and then a secondary market, which is much larger that kind of represents the trade area for Montpelier and where we think you can draw people on a regular basis to this facility. Uh, you may well be able to draw people from outside of this, but we're somewhat conservative in how we establish our market areas for these types of facilities. So that's kind of in the reddish area that we identified as that secondary service area. Again, just a kind of an infographic that's for the city only, but it looks at some key factors. And the reason this is important is this drives a lot of the decisions, not only on what's included in the facility, but also... Uh, a lot of aspects of the operations plan from how many people are going to come to utilize it to what we can charge uh, for fees and, and charges for different aspects of the facility uh, to who uh, is going to be users of the facility, those types of things. That's why it's important to look at this. So that's just kind of a summary infographic, if you will, for the city. 
Um, this is a little more detailed as some of the characteristics we look for. Uh, and we're looking for trends. So we use the 2020 census data. All this information uh, comes uh, directly from ESRI, which is a national demographic service that a lot of uh, cities, counties, and even states utilize for uh, a lot of their information. Uh, but uh, again, we looked at uh, census data from 2020, did projections for 2022, uh, and then projections out to 2027, uh, when this facility ultimately would uh, be built at that time frame. So we're looking for trends. We look at the population numbers, not only for the city of Montpelier, but also for that secondary market area. You can see the secondary market is obviously much larger uh, than the city itself, and that's a good thing. That gives you uh, more opportunities to draw people to this facility. We're interested in the number of households that are there, the household size that gets at the presence of children in the home, ethnicity makeup, the median age, uh, median household income. All those, again, are factors in how people utilize facilities and also their financial performance. That's why it's important to kind of go through this. So this is kind of one of the summary tables that we used in this process. I picked out just a couple of different um, then more detailed information uh, segments from the demographics itself. Uh, one of the key things is what we call a spending potential index or an SPI. Uh, this is based on a national number that's 100. And so uh, if you just took the United States as a whole, uh, the uh, all the numbers for the SPI and all these different categories would be 100. So what it does is it allows us to look at spending potential for a variety of different types of recreation activities, um, for uh, utilization of different uh, equipment, uh, that type of thing, purchasing of that by um, users within your market area. We looked at not only the city, but also that secondary market and also the state of Vermont. Uh, you have, you're in the 90s, so you're slightly under the, the national number of 100, but not still pretty high. Uh, the secondary and, and city are pretty close in their numbers. The, the secondary is a little bit lower, uh, but not dramatically. And you line up pretty well, especially in the city with the state even a little bit higher. So it tells us that you have a decent opportunity from a fees and charges standpoint for how people are currently spending money on recreation activities and how you set your fees for this type of a facility. And before we get off this page, sure. um, are those uh, figures of how much is being spent, are those based on direct information about people who live in the city of Montpelier, or is it an extrapolation based on the uh, national figure of 100? Uh, it's an extrapolation, but it takes it takes that information that we had on the previous um, sheet here, takes all of that into consideration, the median household income levels. So it it is it is a uh, utilizing the data from not only the city but also from the secondary service area, and taking that data and then and then putting it together into this index. And so it's a combination of a um, of, of real world real world data, but also doing some extrapolations from that to get to those SPI numbers. I, I, I can't tell you it's a straight line, but it's the best we can get for trying to estimate really what the ability is and, and where people are currently spending their money, not only in the city, but also in that secondary market. And again, kind of the benchmark with the, with the state as well. Thanks. I, we have another question. Yeah, I said follow up to that further clarification. Sure. In this table where it says average spent, uh -huh. is that per person? Um, or, yeah, it's average spent per person per so, year. So can I just clarify? So fees for participant sports, where you're saying that the average Montpelier resident is spending $125 a year on participant sports? Yep, in some ways, shape, or form. Now, that, that there's a lot of factors that go into that, so that that covers a lot of different things. And obviously, when you look at the average, there's a lot of people that are spending less than that, and there's also a lot of people that are potentially spending more than that, depending upon what they're participating in. So it is it is an average number, and it does tell us uh, that type of information. But you know, it's just one of the data points that's in there. Thanks. Okay. Yep. We also then look at, uh, again, some of the characteristics that we see 
uh, by different age uh, categories and what's occurring based on uh, projections for using the 2020 census number through 2027. And what we're interested in is what's occurring here? What age groups are potentially uh, decreasing in size? Which ones are increasing? Uh, and you can see here, and most of all the growth numbers are in the older age groups. Now, that's not unusual. Probably 90% of the United States shows uh, growth in the 55 and over age categories as the baby boomers work through that uh, those age cohorts. And so, it, it, you know, finding seeing, uh, you know, 50, 51, even in the 80s is not all that unusual, but it just shows an aging population base, not only in, in Montpelier in the in the market area, but also nationally what's going on. But then we also see some negative numbers in that um uh, potential growth numbers in especially in the younger age groups and it, you know again just kind of shows where your population's aging through that process so that again tells us a little bit about potentially utilization of the facility by different age groups moving forward so we we had a lot more uh, information than what I showed you, but those were just some kind of examples. But, you know, there's about 20, 30 pages of data on uh, all the different demographic characteristics. But this is kind of the summary. I mean, the city by itself with an 8,000 population is really pretty small to support a, a really significant recreation facility. And to really make that viable, you're going to need to draw users from the surrounding area. Now, that's not unusual. Most, uh, unless you're in a really large city, that's pretty commonplace. And uh, they have a, you know, most facilities have a regional approach and a draw on with the type of amenities that you're talking about in this facility with, you um, indoor turf and indoor what we call hard court surface, which are like basketball, volleyball courts, those types of things. Um, those typically have a, a more regional draw anyway. So that secondary market then has a total population of, of almost 54,000. Now we're getting to a, a you know a, a population base size-wise that's uh, much better to support a, a significant indoor recreation facility. Um, some of the other characteristics, you have a reasonably small household size, which indicates, again, a little bit fewer uh, number of homes with children. We kind of saw that in some of those previous charts. Uh, but the secondary service area is a little bit stronger uh, in terms of youth and closer to kind of what the state average is. Uh, again, uh, population is older. And then both the state and the national numbers, and we kind of showed you there the, the the growth and decline in the different age groups and really the growth in those senior age categories. Um, median uh, household income, you're remarkably close to the national numbers. Again, your expenditures for recreation activities are lower than the state, but not really by much. You're in those 90 uh, categories, especially within the city itself, which that's not bad at all. You're 90% of what the average is for the United States. But your cost of living is lower than the national uh, number is. So that, again, kind of that mitigates some of that lower expenditure number by the fact that you've got uh, lower um, costs of, of, of service there compared to a national number. You don't have a great deal of cultural diversity, and uh, certainly we recognize that uh, you have people that uh, commute uh, into Montpelier, and certainly during the legislative session, there are a lot of additional people in the community as well. So that's another potential user group for the facility. One of the other things we looked at, and, and there's a number of different um, charts with this as well, but I've just taken one of those. And it's important to understand what's going on right now in terms of sports participation trends. And these are ones that are put together uh, annually uh, by the National Sporting Goods Association. And they track how Americans spend their uh, time with kind of sports activities. So uh, these are a lot of different uh, sports, some of them indoor, a lot of them outdoor. But kind of looking at what's going up in pop is in popularity from 2012 to 2022, and what's uh, going down in terms of popularity, um, so it kind of tells you some of the trends that are there. Now, one of the things that you don't see on there, and most people are obviously looking for, is uh, pickleball, and pickleball's off the charts in terms of growth. It's simply not shown in there because they've only been tracking pickleball growth since about uh, about two seven not about 2017. So we don't have a uh, 10 years worth of a data to to utilize for uh, for the chart itself. But it kind of just and this is way this is just national numbers. So it, it's not 
directly relevant to Montpelier or to your market area. But it kind of gives you an idea what's going on uh, with that. We see a lot of continued popularity in, in kind of fitness related activities. Some of the more uh, uh, popular team sports uh, have shown small decreases over the last uh, 10 years but still have really high numbers of participation. So even though you may see high growth numbers or even slight decline numbers, uh, you look at the, the numbers that are there and it represents millions of participation. So just as an example up there, yoga, 22.9, that's 22.9 million people that participate in that activity. So even though you may see small declines or this, you know big incre increases, you have to also look at how that... Uh, overall number of participants uh, look at. So a lot of people say, oh man, we're seeing declines in swimming. But yeah, it's still 48 million. It's one of the highest participated in activities still in the United States. So anyway, just kind of some basic background information on trends that help us again, understand what people are doing uh, again. And that's a national scan, not uh, even necessarily local. So we use that information. And then we also then took that based on the kind of uh, premise for what the facility was going to include. And there were two options uh, for facilities that were developed. And again, this was coming from Arnie, from the architect for the project in an initial development of what this facility could include. Option one is really a recreation center that includes, a, again, a large hard surface gym area. By hard surface, it means it's hard court, which is really more the traditional basketball, volleyball, can use used for a lot of uh, multi-purpose type activities as well. Also has some weight cardio areas, uh, a fitness uh, group exercise space, but also a large turf area, and that's indoor Artificial turf that can really support, uh, uh, you know, sports that, you know, typically are outdoor, but when you get to this time of the year, difficult to uh, take place in there. So it provides a opportunity for some of those more traditional outdoor activities to come indoor, especially during the uh, winter season. And then there's some other support spaces in there from uh, youth and teen activity areas to community rooms, and then the necessary support amenities, locker rooms, uh, office space, lobby, those types of things. So the, the, the recreation center is projected at this point from the planning model to be about 88,000 square feet. And option two, to add the same amenities but added an indoor aquatic center, which added about 16,000 square feet to the facility. It was primarily a recreationally oriented uh, facility um, in terms of uh, the types of amenities from slides and Lazy River and those types of things as well. So that then got us to about a little over 100,000 square feet for those two. So that was the basis in terms yeah, of are what- you're stuck, Are your slides stuck? Nope. I don't have that in there in terms of the listing of the okay. spaces. So I'm just kind of talking about what these uh, top two uh, options were. So Thanks. the other things that are important to understand is we're basing the first year of operation on 2026, which again would be the earliest that a facility would open. It could be later than that and probably in most cases would be. Uh, again, it represents full operating expenses and revenues. Some of those exist already and we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, the presence of other providers will stay basically the same. In other words, it, it, we can't forecast if some other uh, major uh, facility came into the marketplace uh, after um, after where we sit today. And then uh, it's recognized that the center will require some additional administrative staff uh, and expenses to operate and maintain. And again, one of the really key things is this is based on what we call a written program plan or a, a written description for the facility. We don't have a concept plan and the architect would have to develop that. And um, so we don't know how that facility really lays out yet. That could impact operations to a certain degree, but it really the size of it and the amenities are the prime building block that to really tell us what it's gonna cost to operate and what the revenue stream will be from that. And we certainly recognize that it's going to have to draw well from that secondary service areas we talked about before. And again, it's an operational budget, so it doesn't include any debt service uh, that would be involved for this facility. Just strictly operations, we do have some capital replacement in the budget, but that's about it. Some of the key assumptions, we have hours of operation listed there. Those could vary seasonally. And again, some of the utilization of the um, 
space within the um, like the turf area and the hard court surface area it could be later at night for leagues or for rental space. But that's uh, generally the, the hours that you'd be open to the general public. We also then developed a fee schedule, and this is also projected on at least a 2026 opening, if not beyond, and that's for basically coming in and utilizing the facility as an individual. And we have different options on there for how you can access the facility and uh, different, uh, again, breakdowns, whether it's an adult, youth, senior, or family. So we projected those rates and uh, broke them down by a resident as well as a non-resident. And option one, this is for option one that doesn't have the pool. And then for option two, the rates are a little bit higher once we add that indoor pool with that. So that's also the basis for uh, calculating our a lot of our revenues that relates to just people, uh, what we call drop-in use of the facility itself. So those are our assumptions. This is the summary document when we, and I'll be going through this in a little bit more detail, but when we roll up all the expenses and all the revenues, you can see that the first option nearly covers its cost of operation. It, it has a shortfall of about 50 grand a year. When we add the indoor pool, that goes down and our costs for an indoor pool operationally are much higher than it is what we call dry space. Our need to lifeguard all of that is higher, so we lose money. And you can see, uh, you know, it's a substantial dollar amount, about $400,000. That's not unusual. This also represents what we call the second full year of operation. First year is a little bit tough. Don't know exactly when you're going to open. Also, there's some things that are uh, covered uh, operationally by warranty and some other things. So the second year is really a better baseline to start with. So that's kind of... Um, again, the, the, the summary, if you will, and I can certainly come back to that. So working with Arnie, we, we kind of developed then a, an actual operations budget. Uh, we identified, first of all, staffing requirements. And for any facility, that's the lion's share of costs. Anywhere from about 65 to more than 70% now of an operating budget is in staffing, both full-time and part-time, just to manage and operate the facility, maintain it, all of that. Then we have operating supplies, which are reasonably small amount, and we see the line items in there. And again, this is based on what we know is going to be in the facility and historically what we see is the, is the, uh, the cost of some of these services in, uh, in your uh, area of the country uh, to uh, accomplish that. So you see that varies from about 170,000 to about 250,000, but that's probably the smallest part of the operating budget in the commodities or operating supplies, and that's usually under about 10%. This is the continuation then of the budget. It really gets into contractual services, and that now covers utilities is the prime um, number, as well as uh, contract staff, which are primarily instructors and officials for a lot of the programs and services that take place there. And then you can see also at the bottom, we have a capital replacement number in there. That's not a sinking fund, but it does provide some ongoing capital dollars for equipment and other things to keep the facility up and running. And then you see the totals at the bottom, which were again on that summary document. So then we did the same thing for revenue. Uh, we, we took that fee schedule that you saw earlier. Um, we, we looked again at the number of people based that we would draw to the facility based on the amenities that are included, uh, based on, uh, again, just the size and the uh, demographic characteristics of the marketplace. And so we assigned then revenue and we have revenue worksheets for all of this that get us to the, the fee numbers that will be coming in from the various uh, forms of admission. And then we have in there a big one on this. It's much larger than what you see on many facilities is uh, rentals of, uh, and that's primarily of the turf area and also of the hard court uh, area as well. But, you know, you're looking at over $200,000 just in rentals of that space. And then we have below that uh, projections on revenue from uh, aquatic programs for option two, and then for general programs, which again is a big number. And because of the amenities that are in there, especially the, the uh, hard surface area and um, 
the tariff area, you will be doing a lot of programs and services in here. So that's generating a lot of revenue and that's gross revenue. And again, we had shown the costs in those other categories under expenses as well. And we have a few other things in, in uh, uh, forecast and they're all pretty small under kind of the other categories. So that makes up Again, the totals for what we have for uh, the costs of opera, uh, excuse me, for the revenues generated by the facility itself. A couple other things real quickly. We talked about how, <coughs> excuse me, um, staffing makes up a large part of the, of the budget. And uh, in this case, we've identified the staff that's necessary to operate this facility. Um, and we've identified the salary that those uh, folks would be uh, compensated at, projecting that as best we can out three years, and also factoring in uh, benefits for those positions. We've identified the number in there and the totals on that. We've also shown the existing staff in there that's included in this operating budget. And actually there's two others in there, the facility maintenance form is, foreman is an existing position and one of the facility maintenance worker is existing as well. So, you know, that that's a big number in there from a, a full-time staff of around 700,000 for option one and almost a million for option two. And that's what we see is necessary, to, again, to operate and maintain the facility, as well as to provide the programs and services that are necessary within the center itself. We then did the same thing for part-time staff, and there's always a delicate balance in operating facilities between what's full-time staff and what's part-time. And we tried to, again, project out uh, hourly rates of pay as best we can uh, out three years or more. We do have estimates for uh, program staff at the bottom that are uh, on an hourly rate of pay. The other ones uh, we've shown that as a contractual service. It, it, we showed that earlier as, as a staff cost in, in another area. So again, the positions we've identified in here are ones that are typically part-time uh, within that. Uh, we actually built then a model for the uh, hours that they would have in place uh, per, uh, per week and then calculated out again the number of hours or excuse me weeks per year that that position would be available for both of those we did factor in a benefit percentage for part-time and that really just covers fica and unemployment and those types of things so again that's another large number anywhere from about 650 to over a million dollars for option two and the bulk of the change in option two is the the amount of lifeguards uh, that we have to have for that facility uh, just to uh, uh, meet the code requirements. Finally, then, you know, we uh, just, you know, we developed the worksheets that shows the revenue numbers from admissions in there in terms of how many admissions we expect to see on a daily basis, uh, how many uh, 10 visit passes will sell, three month passes will sell, annual passes. Our annual passes are built based on for option one, uh, drawing from about 10% of the households in the city and 5% in that secondary market area. And that's that's a pretty conservative number at this point for the amenities that you have in there. And then we did the same thing for option two. Again, when we added the pool uh, on the number of daily admissions, 10 visits, three month passes, and then also the month to month. We're here now because we had the pool, the... Um, uh, number of households goes from 10% to 13% in the in the city and from 5 to 6.5 in that secondary market. So that makes up again the revenue worksheets. We also have revenue worksheets for all the programs and services that would be included in the facility as well and we also have sheets for rentals. Um and so we tried to develop a comprehensive model uh, as best we can on what we know about the project right now. So that's kind of quickly through um, the operating plan for the facility and be happy to answer any particular questions you might have. Okay, thanks, Ken. Do we have questions from the council? Tim, are you getting ready? Yes, sure. Um... I guess I kind of have questions and then I kind of look at this and go, it's all really a sophisticated guess <laughs> and we haven't even decided to build a facility. So um, it's, 
So questions, Ken. One, looking at your service area, your extended service area, uh -huh. and thinking, I don't know where you're from. Um, is it I'm from Colorado. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You have mountains too, so you get it. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of looked at the nice circle you do around it, but there's like some mountain yep. ranges that go up through there, and there's very distinct behavioral market differences on either side of the mountains. So you may have some people on the Moortown side of the mountain on this side that might come this way, but I think you'll get very few people on the other side of the mountains that are coming over here for a swim. Um, and based on that, because you have this nice big circle, I, I really question your secondary market area in terms of who's really coming in for this. And the other piece that I couldn't help but think about reading through the report is the seasonal aspect of these facilities and having watched Wedgwood first and fitness and different ones struggle over the years and work through our seasonal cycles. And, and inevitably probably like Colorado, when it's nice in the summer, people don't go inside to work out as much. They bike and get outside and, and all those facilities are struggling for membership and uh, reasons to keep the lights on. And I don't think we would have any different situation with this one. So those are two kind of concept questions I've got about your projections that I didn't seem to be taken into account. Well, I think actually our secondary market for the type of facility we're talking about is pretty conservative. And yes, I recognize that uh, people have uh, different ways that they travel. You have some unique amenities, especially in um, uh, the first option where you have uh, indoor turf and you have indoor gym space that's just not readily available in the sizes that we're talking about, and especially indoor turf. So during the winter months, that, that will draw, and we find historically that draws from a much lar larger distance. We know that people that, uh, and it, it depends upon what you're doing. If you're, if you're there for uh, uh, those kinds of activities, you come from a farther distance. If you're looking to come strictly to work out, you generally don't drive as far. Um, we, we factor that into our projections, and we're known historically for our projections to be cons on the conservative side. Uh, our, the, you know, when we do these studies, uh, the, our facilities, once they're built, historically outperform our operations plans, and we like it that way. Uh, you know, that's everybody's happy on that. So uh, I, I do feel pretty confident, depending upon uh, you know, what you finally end up within the facility and the amenities uh, that we're talking about in terms of size that you should be able to draw from that market area. And even beyond that, again, we factor down the rate of utilization from that secondary market area to a much smaller percentage than we are from coming uh, within Montpelier itself. So it's on things like passes and other things, it's it's less than 50 percent, 50 percent or less on a lot of that. So we recognize that when we get further away from the facility, the rate of utilization drops. So we factored that into there as well. Um, I'm talking about what your second question was, uh, Tim. Seasonal roof? Yes. We also recognize that. Uh, it does vary. Uh, you know, you'll, you know, you start getting to this time of the year, you will get the highest demand, uh, certainly for the facility, because people start orienting more indoor. But uh, we've also seen that uh, for a lot of the amenities, especially for the fitness, has remained reasonably strong through the summer. Most folks will still want to do that. They will do their outdoor things as well. And, and certainly we understand in, in your area and as well as here in the West, we do we get outdoors as much as, as we can. We factor that in as much as we can, but we also recognize with the facility, it'll draw well. Same thing with the pool, even though it's indoor. Uh, in most facilities we find, especially on a recreation-oriented pool, that uh, July can be the third or fourth highest month in terms of utilization of that facility, uh, even when you compare in the easy months of January, February, maybe even March or, or so. That that's It's usually right in there, the third or fourth highest. So it, historically, we it's drawn well because it's a known commodity uh, during the summer. So, yep, we recognize that. More importantly, when we get to that turf-based piece of it and even the indoor gym things, those are actually probably the most susceptible to um, 
the seasonality, especially the turf indoor turf piece where that one people go outdoor. And so we've based our utilization rates on understanding that the, that the rate drops off from about May through September or October substantially. And we factor that into our numbers that we have in terms of rental and also program use. So we try to factor those in as best we can, um, understanding the dynamics of the marketplace. And certainly the, the weather has a lot to do with that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Sal. Uh, these are extraordinarily large buildings. Um, the, the current building at the Elks Club is 15,000 square feet. So this is five, this, the small version. Option one is five times the size yep. of the building, I think. Yep. Um, how are, and of course, debt service isn't in here. How, nope. I realize this is an operational budget, but how are these these buildings uh, of this size and and even half this size? Uh, how are they? How is the construction funded without um, you know, without using tax dollars? Well, honestly, generally they're not. Um, you know, a facility of this size would re almost always require. Uh, at least a strong percentage of it to be funded through public tax dollars to get them to to move forward. So that and most of them are done through bond issues, uh, through a tax increase to support that. Uh, other times there's other mechanisms that are in place and oftentimes you're cobbling together three or four taxing sources out of that and potentially using some other sources as well. But the reality is for the lion's share of public facilities, in the United States, they're funded with the, the capital is funded with uh, at least a large portion of it being through tax dollars. It just seems to me that when we first talked about a rec building, we were talking about renovating the rec center and there was a yep. potential bill there of six or seven million dollars. And we said, well, if we're going to spend that much, maybe we spend a little more and get a new structure. Right. Uh, I mean, the current price to build this is probably over $500 a square foot, which puts the smaller structure at $44 million and the larger structure at $50 million, which seems to me just completely out of the question. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would need to have a, a lot more information to, to, to be able to calculate how that would be feasible by any stretch of the imagination. And to be honest, we while we do the operations aspect, we don't do the capital projections on what it will cost. So that would, if you go back to the architect and say, so, you know, what, what is it going to cost us to actually build this facility? And obviously, that's a really important part of this and trying to define, you know, how you're going to pay for that. Um, not only this, and we've been trying to identify, okay, so if you do build it, what are you going to, what's going to be your financial obligation operationally year in and year out? I mean, the first option here, you don't have a lot of financial loss. Uh, you, you're basically on a break-even basis. That changes when you add the pool, and it's just a recognition. Now you have to not only fund the capital, but you have to find ways to fund an operating deficit for the, the second option. Yeah, we do have some local examples. I think Colchester just built a yep. community center. I think the the square foot price was five hundred and forty-one dollars a square foot for that. It was a fifteen or almost a sixteen million dollar building. It was thirty thousand square feet, so it's about a third the size of the small small building. There. Thanks, uh, thanks for your info, Tim. Sure. Just to, for perspective, the lion lion's share of this facility is in the two main spaces, and that is the hard court area, which is a represents about. 37,000 square feet. So it's a large open bay gym space that can be used for a variety of different things. And the other part of it is the, the turf area, which is about 22,000 square feet. So, you know, those things together represent 60,000 square feet. And those are, for lack of a better term, they're, they're just large barns. Um, yeah, you, I mean, there's still big spans and everything else, but that that's what's driving the size of the building is those two spaces. That's, you know, I mean, that's 75% of the space in option one. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have some questions about the revenue assumptions. And uh -huh. so I'm just kind of scanning through this and they're, you know, I, well, the the numbers of uh, that we're talking about um, seem very, very high to me. 
uh, in terms of numbers of people as well as how much money would be generated. And I'm trying to understand where this came from. Um, so first, a clarifying question. You talked about the daily rates, the annual passes, how much money would be generated from that. Yep. But then there's additional money generated for very specific programs. Right. And so are people paying an annual pass and then every activity they do on top of that, they're paying for? Mm, yes and no. Uh, if, you if you have an annual pass, your fitness is included. And I think we showed that or it's in the report in there. Fitness classes, your, what we call your base fitness classes are included in your, in your annual pass. Um, but other programs, such as if you took swimming lessons or you uh, played in a basketball league or something else, those would be, you be paying extra for those particular programs. On the other side, people could come to the facility not by any time any form of admission that's shown on here and just strictly pay for that class or that program. So you can come at it either one of two ways. Okay, so so then for instance, you've got. Um... Uh, adult leagues, like uh, 12 teams of indoor flag football of adults and um, 12 teams of soccer and 12 teams of basketball with two seasons and, and 12 teams of volleyball. I don't, we don't have this currently. I don't think that anywhere around here, I, I'm just not convinced there's a market for 12 teams of adult indoor flag football. And then also um, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of things on here I could point to that seem questionable to me. There's an assumption well, that there will be four birthday parties every week, all year long, and other kinds of and then rentals are, um, I'm just a little unclear where all this is coming from. Maybe you could explain that. Well, again, what we find with these kinds of facilities is the not only uh, the types of activities that you that you take place there, but also their frequency and, and the dollar amounts that are charged. And we look at that in relationship to um, you know other facilities that are in the general area in terms of uh, of what that might be. So we typically will see these types of programs and activities. One of the things we noted in there. Um, is that uh, these are representative programs only. I can't swear to you you're going to run a league that's going to have 12, you know, um, flag in, indoor flag football teams. You know, it may be more than that. It may be less than that. But, you know, we, it kind of represents what we see in terms of overall utilization of the facility and the revenue coming forth out of that. So, I know the numbers look big with the facility of this magnitude and nature. That's not unusual to see some big numbers in there in terms of what people are participating in and taking part in. So, you know, we build the model. And again, we've done this literally hundreds and hundreds of times over the last 30 years for these kinds of facilities, still taking a conservative approach to this. Um, and, and we know that, uh, you know, with the amenities that you have in there in the market for those types of things, since there isn't really indoor turf on the magnitude that we're talking about available, uh, you know, that provides a unique market opportunity for those types of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, especially on the program side, it is an estimate in terms of the types of programs and the numbers that are there, but it's not uh, so much as it is on uh on some of the other aspects of it as well. So, you know, we feel pretty confident that what you see programmatically is what's going to occur in there in some form with that. Uh, and, and we've seen that with these kinds of facilities. So we know those numbers are not, you know, way out there in terms of what they're going to do. I mean, again, we're looking at, you know, one, one season of this, one season of that. So, and those are what we see in those kinds of things. It's like flag football. It's only, a, it's only one eight week season. And that's, not unusual. Things like basketball and indoor soccer, those have much longer seasons. And typically you can pay, play a lot of those, um, you know, from basically uh, three seasons from the time from first of November down through April on some of that stuff. So, you know, that's, uh, we have a lot of experience with operating facilities uh, ourselves, as well as individuals uh, before we went into business. So we've kind of lived this aspect of this. So, and I, I know the numbers look large and daunting, but we feel that the, you know, it's realistic for what you have within the facility, the market that you're in. Excuse me, where, where are we going with this? 
Well, <laughs> it's like everybody's looking down. It's it, it, it. What's going on here? Well, we're hearing this presentation to, and and then part of the end of it is the next what the next steps are, right? So, are yeah. we there now? I don't think. We're, well, I want to make sure everyone has a chance to answer, ask their questions. Okay, I think that's a, a good good point. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we? So, were you? No, I'm just looking at uh, iPad to Steve. Oh, okay. Lisa. Steve sees. He's still got an old. Uh... Steve, are you still there? I think it may be. A new... does, is, a... does Donna want to talk? Yeah. Yeah, Donna, do you have your hand up? Yes, and finally, I got unmuted. You, it's okay, really very great. awkward. Could we not share the screen anymore? All this information is in the material we got. <laughs> Um, could we go to non-sharing so we can be seen and see? Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, yeah. But I also, I mean, I really appreciate the data and the statistics and all the experience that went into this. And to me, it was a good resource going forward. Uh, I think we need to digest it more and use it as a tool for future decisions. Uh, thank you, Ken. Sure. Um. And Palin, I, you're not, you're not, okay. Um, and Steve, you may be done. Okay, I'm on. Hey, is that Okay, me, you're on. Mr. Mayor, all right, thank yes. you. Yes. This is Steve Cease again on North Street. Um, I uh, kind of echo what I, I don't know if it was, this is what Tim Heaney was asking, but I really wonder what are we doing? We we're talking about, a recreation center that will cost tens of millions of dollars. The city, if it was a person, we'd say, we're just about broke. We're facing incredibly daunting financial challenges of, of, a, of really exceeding priority, ranging from our city water and, and street systems to recovery from the flood. On another front, um, the Times Argus recently ran a story about the new education funding formula in which the finance director of the school speculated that a few years out, owners of a $300,000 house in Montpelier could be pay facing an, an increase of over $3,000 in one year. The city is really in a tough, facing some really tough financial times. And I honestly don't think it makes any sense for us to be talking about operational costs and, and revenues of a facility that, frankly, it just seems completely unrealistic for the city to uh, consider um, uh, going forward with. A 53,000 person service area? Who are we building this thing for? I just think um, this is not a productive area for the city to be spending its time and its limited resources. Even on, even on this level of discussion, we're spending a lot of time on something that Frankly, I just don't think is is reasonable to think is ever going to happen. So with that, I will. Um, sorry, I'm ranting a little bit, but uh, thank you for your time and thanks for listening. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I think if nobody has any questions or questions for Ken, I think that brings us right back to uh, to Arnie and what what the next steps are. And and one of the questions that I have that Ken may not have the answer to, but you may have the answer to, Arnie, is whether how a facility like this compares to some of the other facilities facilities in the area, like uh, what I still call Wedgwood because I never remember to change the name of a new, of a new place. Yeah. Yes, I mean, some of the some of the some of the thought process here is we you know we are trying to come up with some kind of a facility plan. We knew the rec center to renovate was going to cost six plus million dollars to not gain any more space. So when we kind of were talking about this, we're like <clears throat> it started a ways back, but we said let's take a look at some options with the idea that we could always pare down the size of the facility. So the facility doesn't necessarily have to be this big, but we figured let's start out with a with a, a dream and then we can shrink it down. I think the, you know, if we're gonna try to generate revenue 
you know, through a facility that could, you know, create a lot of possibilities and Ken can correct me if I'm wrong, but the hard court surface, if we could, you know, do two to three basketball courts on a hard court surface, that's AAU tournaments and a lot of things that only not only bring basketball and, and opportunities. And also I want to do a indoor walking track, you know, for health reasons, because where do people walk in the wintertime in Vermont and not everybody's snowshoes or cross country skis. My mother was very proud of herself. She brought her snowshoes up to my house because she wanted to go snowshoeing. I took her out in the flat part of my lawn. She went 10 feet and she had enough, you know, and, and we got to be cognitive if people are living longer and, you know, want to be healthier lives. we got to give them an also an opportunity for indoor walk-in spaces where, where they can walk. Um, that being said, <clears throat> you know, we pare down the size of the facility and we look to the areas that actually draw the revenues, like the sports related things, um, um, the community aspect of it, you know, that we have some community space, um, being that, you know, unfortunately the cost of a facility has certainly skyrocketed since the first time we tried to do a facility addition onto the high school, which would have been two basketball courts and an indoor track, I believe. And I think it might have had an ice rink idea. Tim might remember this was a million and a half dollars. That was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Now, you know, we're at a lot of inflated things. So, so a lot of sadly missed opportunities have been missed along the way. Um, and now we're at a point where, you know, how do we, how do we draw families to Montpelier? We, I mean, we may not do obviously a, a facility this size, but, you know, to have an indoor space, a community center where people can participate, I believe would draw families to want to move here. I mean, I know housing is an issue too, but, you know, right now, um, you know, if you, if you go around the city, what are some of the things kids are able to do that are, you know, especially when you get to winter and they can't be outside all the time, or you don't want them out in traffic, you know? So these are things that we're considering. And again, we, you know, we're trying to come up with an analysis of an operations plan. And this was just the model we based it on, but, uh, Ken can correct me, but we could pare it down, you know, sure. once we know the size of the facility and everything else shrinks with it, your staff size, you know, how many uh, part-time staff you need. So a lot of that stuff would be relative, but yet you can still generate the revenues and the birthday party piece. You'd be surprised how many people try to rent the rec gym for birthday parties. And we have to turn a lot of them away because we don't have the space, but Needless to say, we'll have two or three on a weekend on some weekends. But so that's kind of the the thought process. And you know, how do we how do we make the capital city healthier for more people to have more? We have a lot of outdoor recreation opportunity. We have a lot of land with Hubbard Park, North Branch, and now we have the Elks facility. But we got a rec center on Berry Street that's not even accessible. Yeah, I I, I think it's fair to to be looking at this because you know for years we've been hearing and and it's a fact that the rec center the way it is now is is really not adequate to meet the community's needs and so does that mean we refurbish the rec center do we do we replicate it somewhere else do we make something that's bigger than the rec center but still not not on the scope of what we heard about tonight so i think it's a discussion to have we're not going to get there if if we never have, have right discussion and right now i mean realistically um we do have a uh indoor space up at 203 country club but we don't have a gym you know so if we can create a facility where there's a gym and attach it to that building um you know, it creates recreational opportunities and a revenue stream, you know, that people will come over. You heard Chris earlier who, who uh, is on the rec board, which I didn't talk to him before this meeting. So I don't want you to think I gave many ideas, but you know, that that's community, you know, a lot of people today with, you know, with a lot of our cell phones and stuff and texting, people don't even talk anymore. And I was at a rec conference one time where they had a, uh, you know, they showed a picture of this field, 
you know, and people ask, well, what, what's happening out there? Somebody said, Oh, it's soccer. And then somebody said, Oh no, there, there's adults talking. And at the end of it, basically what it came down to is community. You know, you got everybody from different aspects of the community all together engaging as part of that. So. Uh, Tim. All right. When we look at this, it, it feels like one thing I haven't heard mentioned at all, but I think they're part of our community is the school. I mean, we have gymnasiums in our schools. Um, back when I was in the school board years ago and you were working on the program, when it was a little different structure. The gyms were not overutilized in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, we did buy them. We maintain them as a community. Is there some reason it's not part of the conversation of how we do recreation and use the facilities that we own? I mean, well, you've got the civic center, the schools, there's other facilities around that are part of the mix. And I think they all need to be considered, not just something we build for us to run. Yep. Yeah. Um, part of, part of it, um, you know, really since COVID kind of hit yeah. is we don't have the access to the schools that we used to have. Have we tried? Um, we have tried. Yeah, okay. we have tried. And, um, <clears throat> and part of it, you know, is, is either security reasons, um, or the fact that they don't have the staff to be able to have the evening stuff happening. So, so there, there's, there's a few things. It's not as easy as it. So, and, 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 and completely separate district now. So, so it's an ownership issue within our community because we no longer own our own schools. The problem. So by, by having a, a city, you know, facility, it's controlled obviously by the city and they get to you, you, the council would make decisions on how things happen and support. And we'd figure out a revenue plan on how to try to, you know, I've never said that we would never need support from the city, but the goal is, is if we could get something that would happen, that we could get a new facility and our appropriation didn't go much higher than it is right now, that'd be a huge win you know, for everybody, because you'd have a facility that's actually functional for many things. One of the things I was told about the senior center many years ago is when they did the renovation, the first thing they learned was within two years, they outgrew it. They had so many people coming into that space. Mm -hmm. And the challenge also on, on Barry street is even if you could renovate that building, which I think 6 million would be really brutal. And I'm sure it's higher now, but you're not going to, make the footprint any bigger. So you, you can't really draw many more people and where do people park, you know? So that's another issue, you know, I mean, people think a lot of people walk to that facility, but most of the people that I've talked to that walk to the facility are parked further up Barry street. Cause that was as close as they could get to the building. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the challenge. So. Yeah. I, I would just say that, you know, it, to echo what Arnie said is, you have the ability, if this is something you want to explore, this is just kind of the first shot at that, to scale this thing down. And then, you know, you have to rework the numbers in terms of not only capital, but uh, and operations to get towards a financial goal of what you want to spend on indoor recreation, if that's a priority. So it doesn't have to be. The other thing you can do is you can you can break it into phases and and say, well, this is what we're going where we're going to start, and down the road we may add uh, some more space later, whatever that might be. And that's not unusual for many communities to do that in this day and age. So um, I, I think just looking from Arnie's perspective, it, it, how do you want to? And at least in big picture terms, proceed with this in terms of, you know, do you want to continue to study this? Do you want to, to be scaled differently? Um, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a big building and it's it's certainly a big undertaking. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Thank you. I really thought that your presentation made it, uh, made everything much more comprehensible than all the pages, all the print we got. And so I think that's good. I think we, we need to figure out what happens next. I, I don't see the support for doing, doing this. Yeah, Bill. So I think, I think the key takeaway from this is um, when we, you know, entered into the country club road project and we um, identified the uses and it was basically, you know, recreation facility, outdoor recreation and housing. And we've moved the housing forward and we're 
you know, about ready to move the community conversation about the recreation forward. So now we have some information about, you know, size and scale. So, uh, you know, if $44 million at 80,000 square feet is too much, then now we know that, you know what I mean? It's, it's out. I mean, not that we, that's a surprise, but I mean, people get to understand the scale if you want, because we all know people will want the things that were, are listed in these things. When we ask, what would you like to see in a recreation facility? We're going to hear, we want gyms, we want pools, we want, you know, our fields, we want the, so now we can say, this is kind of the size and this is what they cost and this is what it takes to operate them. And so we can have a more intelligent conversation as we go forward about what works and how we phase that. So, you know, I don't think the intent was to come in to say, let's do this. It was to say, here's, here's what happens when you develop a facility like this. You know, there are some nearby Claremont, I know Colchester, they're much smaller and, you know, we've talked to them. I think Ken actually was involved with those, some of those projects. And so, uh, you know, it, this is definitely the beginning of the, the process, not the end. It's just a, it's just a, when we engage the community conversation, we can have some inf information to talk about as opposed to just a wish list. Tim. I'm kind of place, the same place I was with the country yeah. club. I just can't believe we've just paid a consultant to generate this information when we haven't even decided as a community, if we want to be where we want this, you know, the real estate decision has not been made as a community, whether we want it in town well, or, or the country club is like sucking the air out of the room for everything. Cause since we bought it, everything kind of goes there. But I really think as a community in a master planning process and any that I participated in before, people wanted this thing in town yeah. and, well, and, then, so, and they so, didn't want so to like the country. Club. So there's nothing in this data that says it has to be at the country cool. club. I think that, you know, then, then the size and mass of it becomes an issue as to where we are in town would that fit it, th this, this data wasn't based on it being in a certain location. The fact, it what it kind of is. Well, it is if you want, if we want to have an expanded, and I'm not saying we do, but if we wanted to have an expanded rec facility, which has been a subject of conversation for years, uh, for years, I know. Um, it's important to have a sense of the size and scale of what that really costs. And, and so we can have an intelligent conversation about it. And if we, if we, if we, want, and I'm saying we, the community, not we, us sitting on the table necessarily, if we want all the things, we have to know exactly the kind of size and cost it's going to be. So then if we talk about, okay, yes, it should be in town, where are we going to find 88,000 or 50,000 square feet downtown, right? So I think it's, it becomes a reality check. Are we going to, you know, there was talk about building something up by the pool area, or are we going to put you know, what do you put there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe there's, you know, you go through, you say part of the conversation could be, are right, you want a pool? We already know that that we've now know that that it's going to cost us $400,000 a year operating, you know, net loss and operating. So maybe, we're, you know, maybe that, that brings us some data about, should we pursue a pool? Or maybe it tells us we can't do this without regional partners. So we go to, we say, all right, we're not going to do this unless we get all the neighboring towns to come in and contribute. You know, it gives us information to, to develop a strategy about how to go for in which case then a regional location makes a lot more sense because it's got to be available for people. So maybe it is country club road because, you know, Berlin, Barry and others would have easier access to it. Um, so I think it's just provides us some information, uh, important information about what we can afford. Cause I, I you know, I agree. City of Montpelier, I mean, the first thing Ken said in his study was city of 8,000 can't do this on its own. I mean, that was the number one line. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is, you know, we, if we're thinking about this being something that's just for Montpelier, then we've got to think completely different. And, you know, we can't forget that we we're looking at all the other stuff, but the number one thing our consultant said was don't go it alone, or at least don't do something like this alone. And so it's all part of how we go forward. So the plan from now is to do a, a lot more community engagement. Yep. Which is where we were getting angry at having to head the whole recreation community conversation and regardless of location. That's the next up. Okay. I, I think we are at a conclusion of this discussion unless anyone has anything else they want to jump in. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Thanks no for, for, for doing this. No problem. Happy to do it.
Thanks, Arnie. Thanks, Arnie. <laughs> Next up, building and repair and flood resiliency proposal. Why would we mind? Are you about about to share share something or Okay, and uh, well, I'll let's let some uh, someone else start with the questions. I just want to mention that you know this is the type of contract we would normally put on the consent agenda, but just given the flood damage, the importance of it, the fact we've been asked, we thought we put it on the regular agenda just so no one in the public thought we were trying to sweep something through or anything. But it, you know, there isn't anything extraordinary. We followed our normal process. We did thing. You know, there's but we just want to make sure the council saw it and had a chance to deliberate it and move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tim. Sorry to be the one that keeps doing this. So just trying to understand this, because this is a large contract and it's a consulting contract and it's actually not doing any repairs. This is planning and moving forward, right? Yeah. yeah. So planning and so it's designing, I think it's designing too. Yeah, so it's planning and designing the work that needs to be done, including weighing the option. So what FEMA told us is that they will not fund repairs until we've evaluated, you know, mitigation versus prevention and, you know, what are the optimal solutions, most cost effective that will give us, the, you know, they don't want to come back and pay for this again, basically. But and, is, so is this package that we're presented with the base level of FEMA information we need to produce or is it? Yes. No, it's that? above that. We, because well we, above that. Yeah, because we want to also know stuff for ourselves and including changes we might want to consider. Now they may be too expensive to actually do. We've talked about, but you know, if we're going to be tearing our building apart, we ought to put it back together the way we want once and not multiple times. So, uh, but this is doing the, you know, I mean, like if we're going to put a new bathroom in or those kinds of things, do it now while we're, when we get to the construction phase. But more importantly, we we won't get FEMA funding for replacing or mitigating or preventing if we don't do this because they'll say it wasn't properly grounded. And they were pretty clear about that, that this is a group. Yes. Sort of well, the whole, it, so anything we do that's anything that we choose to do that's not flood prevention or mitigation or something like that, that's just our choice. But anything we choose to study that's not. I mean, in other words, this is a this is an evaluation uh, that creates options and um, design and, and a recommended design and why that's recommended. Why this is the most cost effective way to do it. And there is there a, is there a limit there to what what I mean? If we said we want to put on a third floor, FEMA's not going to they, pay that portion of no, the evaluation. I think, I think the. Not I'm just if, getting back to Tim's question of right. Not if if we wanted to put it on a third floor because we just wanted a third floor. No, they're not going to pay for that. Right. If if the consult, you know, if the if the study process said the best way to put this building back so that it's flood resilient is just to open the basement so water can flow through it and add a third floor. That's then that's then they would sure. say okay, that's gotcha. a flood. Okay. 
you yeah. know, so, right. But I think the question that's being asked, and I, think, and I think you were clear about this, but the question that's being asked is that the study that we're buying, FEMA's paying for. Or, uh, yes, and the only issue with, you know, Tim's asked this a couple times, and I wish I could give you a really hard answer, it's going to be at least 75% and possibly more. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's like looking at voodoo, but it's somewhere between 97 and 75%. So I keep saying 75% so that we're on that end of it. But depending, the, you know, the state is contributing some to some of these repairs and some, you know, they fall into different buckets. Some are, you know, what is it, category A and some are category B and yeah. Okay. So this is coming next. So depending on how you fall, there's different levels of reimbursement, but yes, it, this is, this is FEMA funded for the purpose of putting city hall and the other two buildings back together in a way that it, our flood resilient. Just if I might. And when it's done, we'll be able to construct the building because we'll have an approved plan and then we'll do the construction with FEMA money instead of our own. Mm -hmm. Kelly. And if I might, um, just within the RFP that we put out, we did do three levels um, of review. So the first is just to put it back. The second is to improve for flood resiliency or to put it at a standard of, of resiliency. And then the next is to improve. Um, we did learn since we put the RFP out that it's likely that we would be eligible for sort of that second tier at least because of just our code structure and bringing everything up and also where the different flood lines ended up, you know, coming into the building. And so that would be taken into consideration so that it doesn't happen again, um, or at least we're prepared for it. And we want to make sure that we are, you know, sort of battening down the hatches so that then next time around we're solid and we can hopefully, you know, stay downtown in an event like this. Okay. Any other questions from members of the council? I want to make sure everyone has a chance to be heard. I had some questions about uh, when I f first looked at the report because the um, there was a dis quite a discrepancy in the in the cost among the bidders, and I was thinking, but but the evaluations were very close uh, among two of them, and uh, that. I wondered how that, you know, how that could be possible. It seemed like there were two different projects. Um, but it turns out the committee uh, brought brought the the uh, candidates in and in, interviewed them and um, and unanimously uh, selected uh, Stevens as the recommendation. So um, it, the the follow up that I felt was needed was done. I think. Okay, Tim, I know you want to be heard. I want to, uh, I think this is an appropriate time for a motion and then we can have further debate on that motion. So does someone want to move that we approve the uh, contract as proposed by by the manager? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Okay. Okay, Tim. I'm just struggling with this thing. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money. Um, and I think a lot of the things that need to be done are pretty common sense and we know what we need to do. So we're paying somebody a couple hundred thousand bucks to tell us, but I think we pretty much know what's gonna happen. Everybody else in town is dealing with this without the luxury of this kind of a study. Um, and I think a lot of people are doing well with it, uh, trying. It, it just feels like with the need out there in the community, if you could magically just put the money where it needs to go. I know I'm still encountering people in, that aren't in their homes, that aren't getting help from FEMA and we're sucking this money out of the system. I know this is like philosophical enough, this event, but it really bothers me when I talk to people on State Street who can't get into their homes and are getting no help or people on Elm Street. And we're, I feel like wasting this money to some degree. I, I just don't think it's a good spend. And I think we're being mandated to do it through some process through FEMA. I usually don't like being told what to do. But <laughs> so that's my venting, but I, I just think the choice is wrong and we're playing with it. You know, I, I hear that. And I think, you know, the choice is we could do what we want to do and spend our own city money and do it at whatever pace and make our own decisions. And we would still probably need 
to hire someone to help us do it. And, uh, you know, I hear you loud and clear. I wish FEMA covered all the commercial buildings and all the residents. I mean, this, you know, I, 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 you know, those of us around the table don't make the FEMA rules. And I, I, you know, I, I, I think I want to be, I, I just want to clarify, I appreciate the frustration. You know, we're not sucking money that could be going to somebody else. This is money that the federal government has determined goes to municipal governments or, or governments in general to restore what, you know, essential services that is not available to homeowners and um, um, commercial buildings. Uh, you know, I think it would be a different story if we were sort of trying to get ourselves in line ahead of, you know, more needy people. I would, I probably would be agreeing with you. But well, I think ultimately you are, whether you believe it or not. I'm well, sorry. I don't know who else can get the money for public facilities. I, I mean, if there's a case to be made for it, I'm we're yeah. open to it. But it's you know they. So I mean, that's the choice. If we want to do it on our own, we can. That's really up up to you all. But it's going to cost us money from somewhere. Uh, and you can literally uh, move the elevator up in City Hall for the cost of this program. I mean, it, it's that much money. Is there another way to do this study for less? I don't think so. Not to meet the FEMA standard. Okay, that's, that's. I mean, that's you know. I mean, yes, you're right. If we were just, if we weren't worried about meeting the FEMA standard, um, then right, we. But you're right. We have to. We certainly have to deal with the elevator. We have to deal with it. You know, but we've got to figure out whether, you know, trying to seal off water entry versus you know. You know, mitigation versus prevention versus this, that, the other thing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we were talking, you know, our consultant is planning to work to the 500 year flood, not the 100 year flood, so that we're really taking the extra precautions, which I think makes sense. And, you know, we would have to hire professional help for this, even if we were not doing it this way. I mean, we, you know, it's a, it's, it's, you know, someone needs to know what we're doing. We have a, an old, complicated building. And I know you do too. I do. <laughs> I know. And, and so, so what you're saying is the evaluation and the design have to be done. Someone has to pay for it, and this is an opportunity. If for we FEMA. want to, if we, it has to be done this way. If we want to be eligible for FEMA funding for the construction, that's okay. what I want to be clear to say. I think that's clear enough. Does anyone else have anything else to say before they, before we vote on this, uh, Lauren? I think this is more to the frustration Tim is naming than than the motion. Like I think the motion, I I think we should pass it. I think we should move forward. It is extremely frustrating the hoops that the city has to jump through, the individuals, the businesses are having to jump through. I mean, businesses weren't even eligible for, for FEMA funding. Um, and I know that we're the legislative policy team was looking at what can we be advocating to state and and I'm wondering about to like federal. I mean, I do think we need to be capturing like what is what are the failures here that the community is seeing? And I know like there's so many conversations you all are having, but kind of broadening that conversation a little so that we're actually advocating for the changes. I know after Irene, a number of things did change and some hoops that people had to jump through aren't there now. It's maybe hard to believe that that is like it's actually better according to a number of people. So I do think some advocacy could pay off to make it better for people in the future and advocating for some state help um, for some of these gaps that this kind of, but I think for this motion, I think we should do it. But and certainly I can tell you when I've had the opportunity since the flood to talk to members of our congressional delegation, one, one of the things I've been saying is SBA loans are not an adequate uh, response to this. It does not put people back where they need to be. Grants, not loans, but yeah. the the three members of our congressional delegation don't control this. So um I I just I guess I just want to add that I do understand the frustration that Tim's expressing. Um but but I think it's um I mean it's not really much of a of a choice. Um and the information will be useful beyond the, the projects that we have to replace. I mean, we're going to learn a lot about resilience that we would have to pay for somehow with our own money um, that we can apply beyond beyond these structures. So to me, we, 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 we were spending money that we would have to spend anyway. Maybe, and this was, I believe this, the Stevens proposal was about a third of 
the other the other two proposals. So it's it's definitely the the low bid, and yet a pretty comprehensive response to the RFP. Um, I, given that we 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 do have a choice, but it's not a good one. I, I think it's um, it would be foolish not to not to do it. Okay. Any other counselor want to be heard before we vote, Donna? Just real short, and I'm not. A don't mean to defend FEMA, but all of us want government accountable. We want the government to give their money away in good ways. And I do think FEMA's attempt is to help us truly spend the money to mitigate. They've given money in the past that haven't been maybe used as wisely. So I think their intention will help our, us and our consultant to really work on the higher plane of resolving future problems, not just the ones we've seen, but anticipating. So I think we have much to gain from it. Thanks, Donna. All right. Are you ready for a vote? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So we need to take a roll call. Um, Lauren. Tim. No. Sal. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Uh, Pellin. Aye. Donna. Aye. All right. We pass the motion five to one. Next up, you're stay, staying up here, uh, right, Kelly? Uh, building repair and flood. Res oh, FEMA damage inventory. Yes. Yep. Um, so, uh, what we provided in the packet was the submission to FEMA. Um, that's our most up to date sheet. I actually do have a little bit of an update since that point in terms of the percentages of completion. Um, but I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of run through that list with you and to go through um, some of the categorical uh, pieces. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, working on it, um, and then just run through a few slides and then um, take some questions and comments and then share kind of some next steps on how we'll brief you going forward because it's a lot of money, <laughs> you know, so um, here we go. I am starting this thing here. Okay, so I think that looks good for everyone. Um, so just starting right off the bat here, this is what we were alluding to earlier with uh, some of the FEMA public assistance categories. And you can see we've got it split into two areas. Um, one is the emergency work and one is the permanent restoration work. Um, and so uh, on the side of your screen with the numbers, um, you can see how our projects are broken down by these categories. Um, so you can kind of see, you know, we've got, um, some spending at the top there, but the, the larger spend is down towards the bottom in um, item E, which is buildings and equipment, which is really no surprise just given the damages that we suffered uh, during the event. Um, and so in the preceding slides, I'll get into each of these items um, and talk about what the projects are, um, but just to run through each of the categories and what they mean. Um, so A is debris removal, B is emergency protective measures. Those are both emergency work. Um, the permanent work C is roads and bridges, D is water control facilities, E is building and equipment, F facilities, and then G is parks, recreation, and other facilities. Um, I will note here that there were um, instances where um, some of the work that we did previously during Irene really held up. And also um, some of the work that Public Works did around prevention really helped us in some of the areas associated with, um, you know, whether it's our uh, water control facilities, utilities, or our bridges. Um, so we didn't lose as much as we could have, um, but still, nonetheless, we're at um, over, um, so it's 11 million or so, a little bit more than that, um, in damages right now. And so... This is the list. Um, this is the list that we're going to be working on. This is like the first capture of you know what we've got. Um, so just moving through, and I think we can see this. Sorry if it's small. Um, so just starting with debris removal, um, we're at about five hundred and eighty-five thousand. I mean, you can kind of see where we're at. Um, I will note that with the silt and construction debris, we're about seventy percent complete. 
um, in this area, we're still going to see a little bit of that for a while um, because there's some residual silt and such that's, you know, washing with each rainstorm into the bike paths and such. Um, Public Works is aware of that and working on trying to, you know, remediate um, any of those pieces, but we are making some really good progress there. Um, the other areas that we're still working on are um, vegetative um, river debris. Um, and so we noticed some of that around the bridges um, and we're working with the state to clear those items um, up. Um, but then you can also see some of the other um, catch uh, basin cleanings and inspection. We're about 30% um, complete there. Um, but you know, it's on the list and we're getting after it's just not, um, done yet. So what we'll do is we'll brief you on this regularly. So, you know, where we're at, um, with each of these categories. Um, so the next one is emergency protective measures. And you can see the percentages here are much higher because these are all associated with the emergency event. Um, and so some of the things that you see here are some of the stabilization and remediation efforts that we did at the buildings. Um, so when we brought in um, Pure Clean to kind of gut and dry out <laughs> the buildings, that's what you're seeing here. So that comes to the tune of 727,000 or so. Um, and then you can also see, I want to note over um, in this far column, just the prioritization of these items. And so these are all pre pretty high. Uh, there's a few lower uh, items here um, on this list, but are still going to be um, done. Like the recreation center and senior center that are itemized here, um, some of that is associated with you know either storing supplies and maybe needing to resurface a floor um, or you know um, reclaiming spaces once they've been um, you know no longer occupied. Um, so for the senior center, for example, you know, we've got one uh, city department still there, but otherwise we have come back to city hall. So uh, moving on uh, to roads and bridges. Um, so this uh, is about $390,000. Um, Marvin Street slope uh, failure is at about 5%. That's a medium category. Um, Looking at the Northfield Street headwall is another area that we need to focus on. We haven't done anything with that yet, um, but will. Um, and then we've got, um, we did have reports of um, landslides or retaining walls that, you know, just there was some, um, just, just from the storm, you know, things uh, were sliding for lack of a better description. Um, Anyway, uh, so we're about 25% there. So we're looking to shore things up, but it's Prospect Street, Hill Street, um, some of the steeper elevations. And then moving on to item D, water control facilities. Um, we've got a stormwater um, on North Street and Prospect Street, um, and then some other uh, areas that are noted. Um, and I can get you the Excel file if you wanted to see more of the description, and it actually is in the packet. Um, and then we've got Berlin a Dam, um, just looking at uh, remediation or maybe removal, depending on um, you know how we go with that. But that that one actually is mostly complete. And um, when we do a briefing, we can get you more details on exactly what happened with that project. And so those are the kinds of things that will come forward as we brief you, so that you know exactly what's happened. Um, but I just wanted to get you this higher level so that you could kind of you know run through. It's a lot to look at all in one spreadsheet. Um, so breaking it down just makes it a little bit more digestible. Uh, so then moving on to category E um, with buildings and equipment, this is our largest category by far. Um, and so you'll note that um, you've got city hall, fire, PD, um, and you get the rebuild and then contents of those buildings um, itemized. And the percentages on this list are pretty low because we are um, working the process um, and, you know, trying to get things in order to be able to then move forward. Um, some of the areas, the records restoration piece, I do want to highlight, um, because we did send records off site to be freeze dried. And so in the process of, you know, um, finalizing that process and then, you know, seeing what we've got that can be saved. So we at least have things out and off site and we'll be bringing things back on site. And so we'll share more details about that and what those items are once we know a little bit more, um, pretty interesting. Uh, not the kind of interesting that you really want, but you know, um, here we are. So 
Um, another area that uh, just to highlight is that trash receptacles, for instance. Um, so we we have replaced some of the trash receptacles downtown. We haven't replaced them with new. And so, you know, as we go through, you know, what we've done and the tasks associated with that, there may be further discussion. Um, and I don't want to really gloss over sort of City Hall is by far the largest here. Um, and, you know, these are estimates, you know, so that number, I think, may be a little low just based on we had 400 dollars a square foot um, when we were looking at kind of sort of estimating the damages for City Hall and whether or not that's an accurate number. Um, we'll, we'll see as we go through the process. And so this is kind of a starting point, kind of, of what we've, you know, put out there, but we'll, we'll kind of evaluate as we go. Um, and then utilities, um, this is about a million dollars and, um, you can kind of see, you know, what we've got here, D the district heat utility, we are working, um, pretty actively to try to get the meters and fiber optics back up and running, but that has been just delayed by, you know, being able to get things up and running. We do anticipate that um, towards the end of November, we will have um, everyone back online, but we might not have the metering capacity online. Um, so we're working on that. Um, traffic signals and the like, um, we have been able to um, put some measures in place and make some of those um, repairs, but we're at about 60%, so there's more to be done there. Um, and so we're just uh, moving on to something that's 100% complete. I should highlight, you know, something that is happening. Um, the the sewer main um, collapse on Main Street has been, you know, taken care of. It was an urgent uh, thing, obviously. Got that done very fast, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's good. Um, and then, you know, we've got uh, another thing of note here that's at 0%, but is still high is the water meters. Um, getting some of those meters in has been problematic just with you know, supply chain issues and such. So we're working through the list, um, but these are the items that are on the list and this is where they sit categorically within the FEMA eligibilities. Um, and then item G is the last on the list of categories for public assistance. Um, so this is the tune of about 500,000. Um, we have made progress. There are still some areas that we need to continue to make progress on. Um, but we've uh, captured these items and we'll be working on um, doing the work. I know some of the work has, has been like, for instance, at, um, the cemetery, they were really proactive and, you know, getting um, some of the, the drainage cleared as the storm was happening. Um, and then also, you know, fixing it as they went. So that's underway. Um, and then Dog River Field, there, there's been work there, but there's still work that needs to be done. Um, and then there is there are erosion and washout on some of the trails that um, we've got material, but then we've got to start to work to get it back in place. So that's the end of the list. Um, but what I want to kind of sort of end with is that we'll come back with an itemized status of each of those projects. I mean, some of them are complete and we'll just let you know how they were completed um, when we kind of cross them off the list. But others will have, you know, a more intensive process like City Hall, for example. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we briefed you on what the FEMA list looked like, what the total amounts were, and, you know, what we've got for projects on tap. The, uh, the categories, the alphabetical categories, mm -hmm. are those FEMA categories? Yes. And what's the difference between, you know, a category A and a category G from FEMA's point of view? Uh, so in that particular instance, the the first set of categories would be emergency related, whereas the sort of latter part of categories is more sort of a restoration, repair, make permanent kind of category. How um, does it affect reimbursement, if at all? Do we know? Uh, so we'll see. Um, but these categorically, there are different percentages for reimbursement. They would be up to sort of the book at the, the 75% at least. But then depending on what it is, it may be eligible for more match. Some of the reasons, you know, I think we all hate the fact that we can't just tell you specifically. <laughs> but the, the state also puts in some of the matching money and it also depends on them. I think the biggest difference between the first two categories and the second is you have a lot more leeway with the emergency, you know, they don't have that, like, like the city hall, right? Just, we just talked about, right. You know, they, 
you're going to really build this back. We're going to pay for it. You got to follow this process to make sure you're doing it right. The stuff you do while it's raining or like the next day, they're kind of like, yeah, you just got to do what you got to do, you know, make your best efforts. And they're less, it's, it's less of a prescribed process. So that's, you know, things that fall under emergency, like the debris removal and when we come in and, you know, so those sorts of things, you know, the, the, the actual response of people that were, you know, those kind of things. So, so that's really their difference is their standard of review is terms of eligibility is response is one thing in future reconstruction and mitigation is you know, a higher standard of. And at what point do they apply their standard before you? St well, in certain There's things, a certain number we've, of days. we've completed it, but for stuff that we haven't completed that we're still. Working oh, well, once, on. once it's, once it's in the list, you have years to get it done. Um, but do they do they predict the amount of reimbursement? They don't. They don't evaluate no. the amount of reimbursement until it's done. Then they say, "Well." And then this, right? So we're just assuming seventy five percent. this thing that we we don't typically reimburse. I mean, do they give us any inclination of what their criteria is before? Yeah. We start so the all, all of this. I mean, Kelly, well, actually, I'll let you answer. I'm, I'm answering. You actually know more than I. No, Sarah I mean is really the expert. All of that we have a FEMA officer who is, you know, the, these are all called projects in their parlance. Yeah. So these are however many projects we just Yeah, I'm I looking think, at this spreadsheet. Yeah. It's pretty detailed. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, our FEMA mm -hmm. officer has been working with Sarah to categories each one and go through and tell us, you know, yes, this is something we fund, this isn't, this kind of thing. So the stuff that's on the list, we've gotten indication from a FEMA official that this is something they will do. Uh, that they'll is eligible, but they don't give us the, any indication of that last twenty. No, because some of it's some of it's them and some of it's the state, yeah. and they don't have any control. You know, it's our copay, right? Yeah. Okay. Kelly, I thought this was a great report. Again, this is way more comprehensible than just that list of the tiny print of every individual item. Um, should we? What what are you thinking? Like reporting once a month or what? Um, yes. <laughs> I think what we thought of was putting, you know, kind of a written, an easy to read written update pretty regularly and then maybe quarterly coming in and doing something like this. I don't, you know. Yeah, it's I don't really, really it's just an information and it's for the, you know, I think it's good for the public to see the process, but it's not really, I, I think if nothing else, you get to see the, the scope of what, your city staff's working on you know mm -hmm. it's in addition to all the stuff we want to get done we're about to go into the budget let's up this there's 11 million dollars worth of projects that we're doing even if fema's paying for it it's still community stuff that's got to get done and that's yep. where a lot of focus is going on so um you know and it's good to have some of them that get crossed off the list um, so and more of them will be coming soon yeah i agree it doesn't make sense to make kelly come in every meeting her every month and I'll go through this. She'll again. be here. He'll be here anyway. I know, but, uh, but you've got other things you can, you can be doing and talking to us about any other questions before we move on. Thanks. Okay. Thanks Kelly. I'm assuming we have no other business. We move on to council reports. Um, other business? Quick question, because it feels like we're drinking out of a fire hose here. <laughs> I mean, with all this information coming at us, and I do with this, but still trying to figure out. So we're going to, these reports, we've got this budget process we're going into, and we still haven't set our own goals or priorities. It's Come like... Coming to that. Come that. Like, that's what, yeah. It's on the part it's of the city list. manager's report. Good. But yes, that is the proper question. Yes. Right. Everything's behind. Manning is just behind what yeah. we would normally be doing just because of all this. So. Again. So, council reports starting online with Donna and then Pellen. Pat Donna's passing. Pellen. Pat passing. Carrie. Sal. Um, I have a report on the Energy Committee who. Um, submitted a recommendation to the housing committee on the criteria we talked about for 
energy efficiency and sustainability in the RFPs and the evaluation criteria, and they liked what we gave them. They're incorporating it. And uh, we're looking at maybe a collaboration between the two committees on a more detailed spec that we can apply to um, future housing development. So that was pretty good news. Great good project, good for the city, I think. Tim. Yeah. Lauren. Mayor's report. Well, it's it's kind of hard to hard to believe how time goes these days. It, it was it was one week ago that I was standing out on uh, Stonecutter's Way watching our firefighters uh, fight that fire, and uh, it was uh, everybody I talked to was talked about what an incredible effort it was and what a great accomplishment it was to limit the fire the way they did and uh, to prevent it from spreading to any of those buildings which you know, we could have we could have easily have had that whole whole row of buildings uh, go up lose the co-op lose uh, the re the store at RK Miles lose the other businesses and um so our fire department, give, I give them tremendous credit for what they did. All the neighboring towns who who came out, great work to everyone. Um, and, you know, we're still facing what happens on that site and what uh, how we deal with our uh, financial losses. But to do all that without any loss of life or any injuries, just phenomenal, great work for uh, to our fire department for doing that. And I think that's all I've got. And now city clerk's report. I should probably say something just about tomorrow night. BCA meeting tomorrow night. Uh, we had on, we have on deck six names, six hearings, um, three reports to be received. One of those hearings, it looks like they've worked something out with the assessor. So should just be five and three don't know how long these reports will take because now we've started you know i've made a point of getting the reports out to people early so presumably they'll come in and want to comment so i have no idea what to expect but um after tomorrow there is a two-week break before we do it again hopefully in some of that time you get caught up on some of these inspections and maybe our two big things that are still hanging out there jacobs and downstreet might materialize some and if all goes as planned, then if all goes well, we could be in a position to start the abatement hearings in the middle of December, which will go more quickly since there's no committees that have to be formed. It's just quasi judicial come in, make a point. Here's your, here's the decision. So but anyway, we are back to senior center tomorrow night. We're back to the senior center. It's 630, right? 630. We voted to change that. Yeah. And we've, we're only doing, it will continue as we go forward. And Orca sounds like will be covering us as we go into the Board of Abatement, too. We're going to be at the senior centers except for the first Thursdays of each month, because otherwise we'd be competing with a lot of music. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might be entertaining for Orca, but not so much for us. Yep. Okay. Uh, city Manager's Report. Thank you. Um, I have actually a fair amount tonight. Um, so speaking of senior center next week, we will be at the senior center, um, because the school board will be in here, um, probably the same room we were in, um, when we met there last time. Um, I think, I think that's where we are upstairs. Am I, I'm looking over at my evil body up, same rule upstairs. Got it. Uh, and so the good news is, uh, to, since I was perfectly teed up by council member, Heaney, because we didn't table anything or put anything off, we will only have two key items next week. They're both important and both um, policy-based. One would be our legislative agenda, which are, uh, most of our committee got together this week, and we have some outlines, and I'll try to get a draft out to you all tomorrow to look at. Um, and then maybe I'll send it to the whole council, but if we'll do the best we can. Uh, and then finish the strategic plan, which we, we originally were going to try to do tonight, but it actually, so we you know we'll have the full evening to try to at least nail down the big points. So you're right, you know we may not have everything done. And Kelly's been doing a lot of work with um, 
department heads on some of the work plans that would back up some of the ideas, uh, knowing that things still might change. But um, so there's that. Uh, the following me meeting, so that's next week's meeting. The following meeting uh, we will be December 13. So we, you know, we have the Thanksgiving break and the second Thursday. That's when we will be presenting the budget. Um, I think we will also be having um, the folks from VLCT that Vermont League of Cities and Towns that deal with federal funding to come in and give us an overview of what's available, how cities and towns uh, can access it. Thank you for that list. That was great. Uh, so um, just so we can all get a, an update on on that. But just so you know, just to, you know, we had a budget conversation. Um, we've got the, the the due date for, and again, this is all, well, the, the 12, 13 date is the date we would normally deliver the budget. But our process is also pushed back, just like the council goals. Every, you know, we're, we're going to be doing our work after Thanksgiving. We usually are pretty much done before Thanksgiving. But we, so the deadline for requests from departments isn't until next week. Um, but even just taking what we do and rolling it over, assuming we paid, you know, put the capital plan where we think it ought to be, all those kind of things, um, we would be up eight or $820,000 above CPI or $1.2 million above no tax increase. That's before request. So just so people get a sense of the challenge we've got ahead of us, um, it's real. And uh, so, yeah, more money, more money to be talking about. Um, those are those are big numbers. Now, obviously, you won't, you know, we'll have it pared down by the time you get it. But um, just so you know, the order of magnitude. Uh, moving on to the next thing, FEMA. Um, we just got a draft lease today. Um, have I haven't seen it yet? Josh was reviewing it. Um, it was classic federal. We think it's quite long, um, which we don't. We're not. Uh, we're not happy about, but again, I haven't seen it. Uh, we did generally agree with them on terms. We'll see if the lease that they provided us actually agrees with those terms. As I think I mentioned, FEMA, FEMA is doing the project, but GSA, the Government Services Administration, is actually does the leases. So, you know, we talked to one, FEMA says, yep, we'll do all this. GSA says, we can't do all that. And we say, but we said we wouldn't do it unless we did this. And so it's been this whole big triangulation of trying to get it done. And um, so we got the GSA lease. More to come on that, but I think we're getting to the finish line. Uh, the shelter, as was mentioned, the shelter at the Country Club Road site starts next Monday. Um, we are trying to resolve concerns from the, the daycare that is our tenant up there. Uh, who, you know, I get it. They've got concerns um, and we've been meeting very regularly with them, country club, with uh, Good Sam, and they've been meeting with each other to try to allay concerns, but that's that. It's been taking up a lot of, of time. Reminder, more to the public that's still watching, but also the council that uh, winter parking, the uh, alternate side parking starts next Wednesday or the 15th. So one week away, we'll be trying to get that out. Um, Technically, for city and state, Friday is a holiday. Veterans Day is actually Saturday, but the observed day is Fridays, just so you know. Uh, photo. We took, we took one shot at a photo, and we were missing a couple of people. We thought maybe we'd snap one tonight, but we're missing a couple of people. So do we want to try next week just at the Senior Center? Yeah, let's try. Get, come a few minutes early and try to snap a picture, even if it's just inside that room. It's not the most scenic site, but it's good to have everybody. Unless you really don't want to be in the back of the annual report. The I mean, we could do that if we could arrange it. We, you know, if you if you want to, I would love. I think it would be great actually to do it in the basement of City Hall. And I think, it, but we it would re we'd have to figure out a time. We have to manage a time that's not not. So, if you would like us to try to find a time. Between yeah. now and then, for the basement of City Hall, we'll try in the fallback position. We'll be we'll do it at the council meeting, assuming everybody's present in person. How's that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, lastly, just a quick follow up. You know, on the housing ordinance you passed tonight to go uh, to go forward with that. I thought uh, I just make sure I'm clear and we're all clear on how we want to proceed with that. We had a few sidebar conversations. Normally, what would happen when the council makes a decision like that? 
is we staff would take the recommendation from the committee that they gave us. As you know, we, we got legal, um, I got a legal opinion that we shared with all of you. It's mostly consistent. We'd probably ask the attorney to take their proposal and put his tweaks on it and then bring it back for a first reading for you all, which you can then change it however you want. It becomes your document to do it as you will. And you can have as many readings as you want until you have a final reading and approve it. Um, but normally we have at least two. I think the real question is when, when do you want to do that? Just knowing that we have budget coming at the next several meetings. Um, but we, I mean, it doesn't, budget doesn't have to be the only thing you do, but it does tend to take up the bulk of the bandwidth for a meeting, but one reading, you know, and I suspect this is going to have some conversation. This isn't going to be a, oh yeah, this is routine. Let's, so it's up to you. But, um, <laughs> let, let's talk okay. at, our, at our weekly meeting and All we'll right. figure it out. A mayor will guide us through. <laughs> Lauren. So assuming you're able to come to terms on a lease within pretty soon, any idea then of like what the timeline is from there? No. Uh, I do know that the state is, you know, I think has taken care of like all their permitting issues. So I think that's all set to go. Um, I, you know, they've been doing some preliminary testing up there. I, I, I really don't know. I don't, I, I would think, I would think they would have been higher, more highly motivated to get this done faster. Let's just say that, um, but they don't seem to be. So I, I really don't know how fast they can turn it around once they're there. Um, just quickly, since we did talk in broad scopes, I think the things, there's nothing hugely different than what we talked about way back at the first meeting. And I took my guidance to be as long as it was generally consistent that I was okay to go ahead. Um, just so you know, the key issues is we're trying to make sure we've got control at the end, at the end, so that it's our decision whether it continues. It doesn't happen to us that we have control. Uh, that uh, and the main issue was the infrastructure improvements and in where we ended up on the water line improvement was they really didn't think they could do it, but they are willing to pay us the dollar value for it, and that. It's about eight hundred fifty thousand dollars when we got a final estimate. So that will actually be there. So when we said there would be no lease rate, there actually is going to be a lease rate. It's going to be the amount of the water line. And the good news is, if it gets extended, then that lease rate continues, even if so. And that took a you know, and, and that's actually been a big snag because technically that creates a value for the land, which is more than GSA is willing to pay. But FEMA said that's the way we'll do this. So we've been trying to work that through. So I think, I think we got there and how we can do it. So, uh, and, and, you know, the, and then this is just more of an aside, just anyone who's ever dealt with the federal government knows this, but um, you know, FEMA is telling us, Oh, it's a, it's a going to be, you know, they're going to be there for 20 months. Cause by the time we get these things done, we know they're going to need at least 12 more months. So, you know, the minimum, time this is going to be is 15 months it's more likely going to be 18 so we're just like well fine do us a, give us a, if it's 24 months just give a 24 month lease lease rate blah 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 now mind you so they could have had 24 months at eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right this is a total lease um <laughs> but gsa doesn't do 24 month leases so they only do 12 month leases because they can't guarantee and we said well we're not taking a lease that doesn't pay us our full money. So now we got to get out like a 12 month lease for $850,000. <laughs> so and if it extended, it. <laughs> we did agree that we'd only take half for the other 12 months. So it's still another $425,000. So they're going to need 24 months and it's going to cost them an extra $425,000. You you drive a hard bargain, Bill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, you know, it's just been interesting. So that, but those are the kind of things. So really, it was the closeout. You know, we have the option to say everything's got to go. Um, and when you say they can't do the water line, in other words, they're going to put the water line in. They're going to give us the money to do they're it, but they're going to actually put in a line that's. They're put, so they're putting in the water. They're going to put a water line from the existing water line 
into their buildings right. and they're putting in fire suppression and all that stuff. They're going to give us enough money to do the the, Everything the large 12 inch water they, line that we want. They don't need that extra volume. We've figured that but out. But they'll give us but the money gonna, but we do. Yes, but we can do it when we're ready to do it. Or plus 400 pounds. Well, that's, that's I, I, I get to see what's actually in the lease. Because, yeah. you know, we talk, we've talked about a lot of options. So we'll see which one they came up with. Maybe they figured it out. And Anyway, so I just want you to know there will be no surprises. It might look diff a little differently than we have, but it's all basically the same as what we talked about verbally. Don't know what's in writing. And that's my list. All right. Thank you. And we can, we will be adjourned we at 10.22 p.m. Thank you all.